Well, good evening. Welcome to the Institute of Healthcare Management and the next in our fabulous Health Chat series, where this evening we have something really unique. We've got the marvellous Paul Devlin, who's part of the NHS Emergency Care Support Team, and we've got the sensational Steve Thomas, General Manager, wait for it, of the Radio Society of Great Britain. And they're going to tell us all about shortwave radio, how it's being used by the NHS and their huge army of enthusiasts around the country for the greater good. As always, we've got Roy Lilly in the facilitating seat. If you've got questions and so on that you'd like to ask as we go along, just put them in the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen, or if you want to use the chat facility. And after about 25 minutes, half an hour, I'll facilitate a Q&A. But for now, thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, doing this with us. Roy, over to you. John, thank you very much and good evening and welcome wherever you are watching this. Uh, if you're watching it live, it's great to see you. If you're watching recording, thank you for watching. Now, you know, when you go to an ordinary conference, there's, there's always somebody late coming in at the back. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed how they come in at the back, but there, there's, there's never a seat at the back, is there? The, the, the spare seats are always at the front. So people come in and they look around at the back and then they do the magic thing. They look down and they kind of tiptoe to the front of the room. Now, when they put their head down, of course, they think they're invisible, but everybody in the room watches them go to the front and sit down. So what we're doing now is allowing the people in the real world out there to come in, sit down, make themselves a brew or pour themselves a drink, get themselves organized, get their screen maximized so they can see everybody on the screen. I'm giving you a few minutes to wriggle your bum and get organized. And uh, I think we'll make a start now because if you're not ready by now, you never will be. So good evening to you all. Thank you for tuning in. And let's say a big welcome to Paul Devlin and to Steve Thomas. Gentlemen, good evening. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, absolutely fine, Roy. Uh, thanks for inviting us on. Great no, to see you. It's, a, it's a great pleasure. And Paul, you're with the... Uh, the Emergency Care Improvement Support Unit. I imagine you've been fairly busy in the last 12 weeks. Yeah, well, I think we all have, Roy, and it's lovely to see you. Thanks for the opportunity of tonight. Um, yeah, it, it, it is great to see you. And I think we've all been um, actively deployed and redeployed on, uh, on COVID response and things. But, um, yeah. but, it, but it's, all, it's all good stuff and uh, we're all adding value where we can. Well, I'm pleased to see you well anyway. That's the important thing. What, do you actually, you. what have you been doing, Paul? So personally, um, I've been supporting health economies to adopt a new way of responding to and schedule care, and that's patients coming through trouble one or 999 or GP practices. If they're not seriously ill or injured, then what we're doing is looking at how we can treat those patients um, as far as possible in their own homes or close to home. And we're calling it on schedule care coordination, and, and, and I'm leading on that um, as part of the ESIST work at the moment and helping well, really, to... That's really interesting. We actually, we have to talk to you about that. I, I, I've read a statistic yeah other day that there's a huge percentage of paramedic calls are just they're people are getting nowhere near hospital the paramedics are sorting people out in the back of the van and taking them home which uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering you know how much of that we're going to do when this is all over do you think it's sustainable um, I think we need to um, organise our services in a bit of a different way to make it sustainable, Roy. And I think we've seen a lot less people, as you know, wanting to go to hospital and calling the ambulance service. So rather than return to um, pre-COVID scenario where there was a lot of patients attending A&E departments that didn't need that service clinically, what we need to do now is make it far simpler for paramedics, GPs, community nursing teams to access their community services than it would be to do anything else. And I think if we can do that, we're, we can sustain this. Yeah, I've had a campaign most of my professional life in the NHS and it's to make the hospital history. So perhaps we might, we might, we might finally get somewhere close to doing it. And Steve, you've got, uh, let's have a look, you've got three million, I think, people worldwide that you can talk to through the Radio Society of Great Britain, 75,000 radio amateurs here. Have you, been, have you, I mean, I'm interested to know, has, has sort of COVID been a topic of conversation when you've been on air? Oh, absolutely, definitely, yeah. Um, and the, the Radio Society of Great Britain represents those UK radio amateurs. And as you, I think you'll hear, or we'll talk about later, um, we run a campaign with Paul to try and help people um, through that, the situation. Um, but generally, yes, there's 3 million radio amateurs around the world. Um, and amateur radio is really a, 
it's a hobby for people who are interested in the technical uh, aspects of radio communications, wireless communications. Um, so we're the National Society for Radio Amateurs in the UK. Yeah, I, I, can't, get, I can't get over the fact there are 75,000 radio amateurs across the UK. Uh, do they all have a licence? They have to be licensed. They do, absolutely. And the RSGB, uh, we run the exams for, on behalf of Ofcom. So they all have to learn some technical skills. Uh, they take some exams, but there's three levels. So you can start nice and easy, then intermediate, and then the more advanced or the full licence. Yeah, so you you've, been, you've been doing the, you've been doing the um, uh, the exams and what have you online? Have you during the COVID? Uh, we have. That's one of the changes we made because um, there are radio clubs that do training around the UK, but of course they haven't been able to do that, and they normally host the exams as well uh, at their club meetings or at exam centres. So we've been doing online exams with remote invigilation, um, using video conferencing like this, so people can actually still get their licenses during this time and we've seen a real big upsurge in people coming into it really that that is interesting is it do you think you're going to continue to do it online when all this is over we think we probably will um we we also want the you know the clubs to be involved again but um we've we've seen such an increase during this time that um yeah. i think we'll try and maintain it but it how, was, and how, was, how do people paul how do people get uh, on air i mean have they got to buy a load of expensive kit or is it fairly low cost? How's it done? So Roy, one of the things I love most about the hobby, and I'll go to Steve in a minute, if I may, in terms of the technicalities of that, because he is, um, he, he, he's obviously running the Radio Society of Great Britain. He is our specialist that we all turn to and bless him for all his support with launching the NHS station. But, um, but no, one of the things I love most about the hobby um, is that it's um, it's incredibly diverse. And by that, I mean, you could have um, people that aren't, aren't employed. They might be in a low socioeconomical group um, and they very simply can get on the air through a, a simple little handheld device. But using the um, global platform that that is amateur radio to speak to people all over the world. Um, and equally, if you happen to be incredibly successful with, um, you know, uh, several thousand pounds at your disposal to use the whole of the technology available, then yes, you can be talking to the International Space Station. You can be um, using specialist antenna systems to transmit um, um, frequencies, bounce them off the moon all over the country, um, use satellites. So the hobby is so diverse. It's fully inclusive, Roy. Um, and it's I love, I love the it. idea of talking to the International Space Station. So, Steve, what, what's, what does entry level mean? if i wanted to start up um well we we run a, a license called the um the foundation license or foundation exam so you can do that really easily it's multiple choice questions so there's a there's a book there's an exam syllabus it's a it's a basic understanding of radio principles it's uh right. and, and if and and the kit what is it paul was talking about a handheld kit uh, yeah. i mean what's what's the cost of an entry-level piece of kit roughly oh i mean you could you could start with a radio for uh, sort of 25 30 pounds these days really? Yeah, uh, just and where just, do you get it from? Because I mean, Maplins are closed now, aren't they? Without Maplins, <laughs> no, I can't. I'm uh, there, lost are, without there, are, there are amateur radio dealers around the country and uh, online as well. Yeah. And of course, there's some of the equipment. Sorry, the video. The some of the equipment behind me is the the higher end stuff. Um, yeah. You know, you can you can spend as little or as much as you want. Yeah, and it's really interesting. Now you're you're Steve. You're at Bletchley Park, aren't you? The city. Yep. Which, is the, which is the home of the Radio Society of Great Britain. And uh, you were kind enough to invite me uh, for the launch of what we now lovingly know as Golf Bravo 2 November Hotel Sierra. So I had to, I've been practising that to get that right. And that's the, the call sign for the, uh, and, and, and the NHS call sign. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But Bletchley, of course, is a really interesting place. I mean, we all know it from the code breakers and, and the wonderful work they did during the war. But there's a lot more going on there now, Steve, isn't there? Um, well, wh where I'm sitting now is the RSGB's National Radio Centre, which is at Bletchley Park. <clears throat> and here we, we allow people to, well, we encourage people to come and see amateur radio in action, learn about radio um, and get to know a bit more about it. Because a lot of people don't know that it's, it's a technical hobby that's still very relevant in these days. So we had 97,000 people into the National Radio Centre here last year. We're closed at the moment, of course. 
which yeah. means I can sit here and talk to you. Um, 97,000 people, that's a hell of a lot of people, isn't it? it? It is. So we're very proud to have introduced amateur radio to that many people last year. Yeah. Blimey, um, and if they, were, if they all queued up social distancing, it would go from here to Bognor and back, wouldn't it's it? A long, it's a long what you, queue. Well, you could have opened up, do you know? Um, no, not yet. Um, uh, we're waiting to see uh, when Bletchley Park in general open. So Yeah. We'll well, it's got, I mean, having been there and done it, if you're watching and thinking about going uh, going somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, for a day out where we can do it again, go to Bletchley Park and go and visit Steve and his colleague because it really is a very interesting place. They've got lots of... Uh, uh, older kit as well, haven't you? You've got uh, uh, oh, there's one. the there's the whole history here, so you can see yeah. where radio started. It's, and it's the, the RSGB itself has been going since 1913. Yes. Um, do you, do you, who started it? Because that was uh, in the First World War, wasn't it? Um, well, it was. It started off as the London Wireless Society, I think, and then moved into being the Radio Society of Great Britain. Yeah. At 1913, anyway. So amateur radio itself has been around some time, but the important thing is that it moves with the technology. So now, um, as Paul was, was mentioning, um, people might be transmitting on microwave bands, very high frequencies. Um, they might be bouncing signals off the moon. They might be doing amateur television. Um, there is a, the, a whole world of technology and amateur radio just moves with the times uh, and sometimes moves those technologies on as well. So wireless communications is absolutely all around us these days, isn't it? It, it, well, of course it is. And, and it's very interesting for me when I came over, I remember talking to some very surprised person on the other side of the world. But the, the interesting thing for them was the fact it was the NHS. And what struck me is the universal appeal and recognition of NHS. Yeah. Uh, those three little words, National Health Service, NHS. People recognise it, don't they? They, they absolutely do. Yeah. And I I think that's why uh, Paul and I got together for the campaign, to be honest, isn't it, Paul? Yes. Um, yeah. You know, good for, uh, good for radio and definitely, hopefully, useful for the uh, NHS as well. well exactly. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to Paul um, and uh, we'll get on to your current campaign in a moment because it's really interesting. But just take us back to, to when you started, uh, you know, how you managed to get GB to NHS. Just take us back to that. I mean, I know this story is quite interesting. Just take us back to the beginning of of the birth of golf bravo 2 november hotel sierra oh so roy what where it actually got born out of is um a request really from professor brian dolan who headed the end pajama paralysis campaign which it's a global campaign to encourage people who are in hospital to get up get dressed and move about yeah um, just, just let me just interrupt you there for those of you who don't know brian dolan you can pick him up on twitter he's actually uh from new zealand isn't he well he's uh he's a, a scot i think he's a scot he's an irishman isn't he um he is. wonderful soft speaking voice uh came up with the idea of well the, the strap line was as end pajama paralysis the idea was to get uh, people who were decommissioning in uh, deconditioning it lying in bed get them up get them dressed and get them moving uh, which helped to get them home quicker and it, it really uh, it, it captured people's imagination didn't it everywhere I went in hospitals I saw this uh, Brian's happy smiling face and these pajama uh, logos that, that he had uh, and he commutes backwards and forwards I think from New Zealand he's in New Zealand now who knows he's, he could well be watching I know so so it was a conversation between you and him Paul was it yeah and also my boss Pete Gordon um, from ESIST and the concept was that Pete and Brian wanted to as they said get the concept of and PJ paralysis into as many hands as possible so people just understood the concept and appreciated the value of getting up getting dressed and moving about and getting home quicker and they said to me um, yeah, have you got any ideas for how we can get this in the hands of the many as they said and I said, yeah, I do. I said, um, you know, with 40, 40 Funnily enough, of the world I know three million people. <laughs> I know three million people. And, you know, people forget, you know, in our little tech technology bubble that 40, 45% of the world's population do not have access to internet or broadband or, or 3G, 4G SIM cards and stuff. Um, and if you're the National Health Service wanting to be completely um, inclusive with your message, um, you, you've got to use radio communications and that's why I pitched the case that we should support cascading that message of health and well-being um, to as many people that would listen to us by using the National Health Service 
station and rather than just have it as a one-off um i i just kind of apply to have a permanent special event station um dedicated to helping the nhs spread health and well-being messages globally and, and you had to it was a bit of a fight wasn't it to get um that call sign gb2 nhs yeah so um actually so we um, we went for GB1 NHS. We've got GB2 NHS running as a special event station to support um, the Get on the Air to Care campaign. And there's a there's a, a radio amateur who's actually um, been running a special campaign to try and talk to as many people about it and promote the campaign using GB2 NHS. And that's a temporary call sign. Our call sign is uh, I wanted Great Britain 1 NHS. So we, we are the kind of like um, the top call sign there um, dedicated to the NHS. Now, when I approached um, our regulator, the Government Office for Communications, Ofcom, um, they just basically said it's a nice idea, but to be quite honest, we don't tend to do things like that, and we don't really have a precedent set. <laughs> I mean, so, I just some bureaucrat sitting behind. Yeah, the yeah. And I that was the end of it. That was the end of it. They said, well, you can have a go and, and have a special event station for about 20 days, 28 days, but we wouldn't really look to be doing anything permanent about that. Um, I said, well, is there anything we can do to ta ask the question? And they said, oh, yes, if you'd like to put in an application with a letter, we'll take it to what they call their standards committee, where, and, and Steve works with the standards committee, you know, all the time, really, but the likes of me never even knew they existed. Three weeks later, they came back, um, Roy, and they said, um, congratulations, we're going to issue you with GB1 NHS, um, but we're going to attach it to you. And therefore, if it comes into disrepute, we know where to go to. So I then I thought, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> um, and then it went and, quickly. And I, 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 think Steve. Right, Steve, uh, I think I'm right, Steve, that there are some quite big penalties, aren't there, for the misuse of these call signs and the misuse of the airtime. So oh, can, um, Paul, Paul can expect Paul to be uh, in Broadmoor, can he, for some Paul, time? Paul would never misuse it, no, absolutely. <laughs> but, and to be fair, during this the campaign, Ofcom have been incredibly supportive as well, haven't they, Paul? So since, since we got started, then they've, they've really helped. So it's, yeah. it's been good. Once, well, the, I, back, the background's really interesting. So, right, OK, well, let's, let's get on to what we really uh, are talking about tonight. Uh, and that is the campaign. So get on the air to care. Um, tell us, Paul, what, what was the aim of the uh, campaign uh, and, and how did you go about it? So how it came about, Roy, I'd, I'd, I'd always got an idea that we could use amateur radio to improve health and well-being in terms of like a little public service, if you like. Like Steve mentioned earlier, it's the science, it's getting your brain working, it's connecting with people you don't know across the world, uh, it's constructing equipment. So there's a lot of kind of positivity around that in terms of your own emotional health and well-being. So that's always been one of the key objectives for me, launching the National Health Service Station. But when we came on uh, unprecedented times with COVID-19, I thought, well, we've got a golden opportunity here to really help people. Um, so I came up with an idea called On the Air to Care, um, and um, you know GB1 NHS is an incredible brand because we've got the, the National Health Service there um, but I just knew that we wouldn't get our campaign to fly unless we'd got the support of Steve and Heather Parsons mm. and the Radio Society of Great Britain. Heather's the communications manager for the Radio Society of Great Britain and between the three of us we came up with the campaign um, and, and the idea was to actually, Heather's idea was to have a uh, a call to action which was get on the air to care um, and so I came with a bit of a you know half thought up idea with no real potential of going anywhere it was a nice idea and then Steve and Heather then through the rest of the kind of colleagues in RSGB turned it into something incredible um, and we've got truly kind of national and international interest in the campaign now. What did you think Steve when uh, Paul turned up with his wacky idea um it, we were trying to work out um how we could make it happen to be actually to be honest because we were at the at the time we were just moving all of the rsgb staff we're based in bedford just down the road uh, and i was moving all of the staff to working from home you remember how that all started it was yeah. all, ha all happened in a bit of a rush so yeah. we were right in the middle of that when paul said what do you think um and it sounded like a great opportunity but it sounded like it was going to be a bit of a struggle, um, but we went for it. And our objectives really to start with 
was I mean, Paul had obviously got the the NHS objectives, and from our point of view, with the Radio Society of Great Britain, we wanted to we wanted to show that we were supporting radio amateurs in the UK, and of course, linking with the NHS um, and using both names of both organisations seemed like a fantastic way of doing it. And, and what was the, what was your your uh, your content? What uh, you know? What 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 was the message really that you were trying to broadcast? Well, the, the, what we really wanted to do was encourage radio amateurs to get on the radio and keep in contact with the people that they would normally keep in contact with, but with a little bit of remembering that people are socially isolated. Perhaps they can't go off to their radio club meetings that they normally do. So remember to get on the radio keep in contact with everybody, maybe try a few extra things that they haven't done. As we said, amateur radio is such a broad hobby that you could do something different on every day and you'd still be learning something. You might be constructing, you know, building your own radio. You might be trying Morse code for the first time. You might be trying satellite communications for the first time. So encouraging people to use the time when they're locked down at home to do something else seemed like a fantastic use of the campaign. Um, and while reminding people that the NHS were doing such a fantastic job at the same time, right? That, that I think, Paul, was was about how we we thought about it. Is that fair? Yeah, abso absolutely, Stephen. And, and I think, Roy, the the only other thing around that is um, uh, thanks to yourself and John for t for tonight. And this is a key part of our plan as well, mm -hmm. is to introduce the concept of amateur radio and and how to get into the hobby to people that know nothing about it. Um, and mm -hmm. you know it's it's promoting the awareness of the hobby and it's promoting the uh, benefits of being part of this community. Um, and Steve did mention you know all those visitors to the NRC and. Roy, as you know, we have our special events for the National Health Service where we can at the National Radio Centre at Bletchley. And that's because that is literally an international centre of excellence for radio communications. Every aspect of amateur radio is accessible through that centre. And um, what's more, the volunteers that support um, Martin, that Steve mentioned earlier, the centre manager, their coordinator, um, they're really specialists in their knowledge. Um, that's helpful for me because you could write my extensive knowledge of amateur radio um, on the back of a matchbox and still have room for your shopping list really but when I go to Bletchley I'm surrounded by all these incredible specialist people with all the equipment and you know the last time we were down there we were using satellites to get our message out um, to talk about the importance about getting people out of their beds and in, out of their pajamas and dressed and walking about I mean I mean, that's just an incredible concept, um, but that's what you can get by getting into the hobby and getting down to the radio centre at Bletchley. So, you, so, so your objectives were partly to get people involved in, in doing amateur radio for themselves. The ones that you were connecting to, how, you know, what, what was their view? How did they take to the idea of the NHS talking to them? Well, we, sure. but sorry, sorry, Paul, Steve. no, after you. No, go ahead. You go first. Go on, no, Steve. I, you go first. I was going to say we 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 allowed people to. Everybody's got a call sign when they get a license, and we spoke to Ofcom, and they said, "Well, if you'd like to, you could add slash NHS to the end of your call sign during this period." So some people got behind that. They had some way of showing the support of the NHS, but a, a, a huge number of clubs have <clears throat> got together and done different things on the radio these days, and the campaign has just grown and grown. We put out. Um, we put out obviously lots of press releases at the start and it was picked up by the BBC. There's been radio interviews. We've been on the, um, there's some, been some coverage on TV, on the BBC News national website. But we've seen as a result of that, I think hundreds of people coming into amateur radio during this last few months. So that, that's been really useful for us as well. Um, so it's given radio amateurs a reminder to keep in contact with each other. A reminder that some of the am that amateur radio is still there and people are coming back to it who perhaps haven't been involved in it for a few years we've seen a lot of that and we're attracting new people as well all during the lockdown situation and giving people the opportunity to recognize the nhs at the same time well, i think it's an amazing achievement and, it, and if you're uh, watching us live tonight if, i'm sorry if you're watching a recording but if you're watching us live you've got a question that you want to ask steve or paul please do no question is too stupid because uh, i don't know anything about this either so we're here on a 
journey of discovery or if you've got a comment that'd be it'll be great to hear from you so how many people paul do you think we uh, we've been able to i mean there are 500 affiliated clubs around the uk i think god knows what it is on a worldwide basis how many people do you think you've you've contacted gosh steve i don't know if you've got any idea around um stats and things it's so Con contacting people in terms of um, being on the air I mean uh, that's that's really tricky to to yeah. get a handle on and I know in terms of reach of our campaign Heather um, our RSGB communications manager has been monitoring social media um, we've encouraged people to use the um, get on the air to care hashtag um, so we've been monitoring that as well haven't we Steve to try and track we, we, people's we have and we and we know the the media campaign itself has reached uh, a phenomenal number of people we're still counting it but it's still continuing so we're still having we are very grateful for this invitation today we're still taking you know media requests but the, we we put out um our own requests to our own members to say tell us your stories about what you're doing and we've had a huge number of those in and some great ones from youngsters that have got involved and also tell us about them too give us some idea of the stories from the youngsters okay well we've got we've got one from um <clears throat> a young lady called uh, i've just got to read Anne marie who's 11 years old uh, down in cornwall and she's been arranging on-air meetings for other people in cornwall on the radio and coordinating that herself at 11 years old and she <laughs> sent she sent us in uh, you know she's she's been interviewed by on bbc radio as well yeah. um we we put we put out an appeal. We run a, a magazine. I'm gonna to have to I'm gonna to have to wave it at you. Sorry. We yeah. uh, we publish a magazine for our members every month. There we go, Radcom. And you can see on the front cover there, the logo, and then all of the pictures that people were sending in of all of the things they were doing during the lockdown time. Um, and there's one on there. I know um, there's a friend of mine just holding his his very young baby, uh, and he's looking after the baby because his wife, who's a GP, was out helping other GPs at that time. So he was on the radio with the baby and thought that's an ideal opportunity to support the campaign. <laughs> we left, have, left holding the baby. We have I, hundreds of those stories. It's, it's really good. Yeah. And, and Paul, have you got any recollections of uh, interesting stories and people you've spoken to? I think it's, I, I, there's one funny story um right anytime we go on the air um we don't we, we don't necessarily need to publicize it amongst the radio communications community that much but anytime we go on the air with the nhs call sign gb1 nhs where we always have um a lot of people um end up waiting to just come and talk to, to us really basically because it's like a it's almost like a little kind of um, radio operator thing that if you can if you can operate a, um, a rare call sign or a particular special call sign it's just a nice thing to be able to do rather than just talk to your mate up the road you can do yes, that anytime and people i know that the community want to claim that they've had that contact as well they do they? Because they keep yeah. a record of their contacts yeah and you know word gets around we are the only government level organization in the country to use amateur radio as part of our normal business um, in the way that other big organisations may have clubs for their staff out of hours but they don't use it as part of their normal business so that's a bit of a kind of a big thing for the radio communications community and we end up with a lot of people waiting to talk to us and very often I'll say we'll, we'll be on the air for two hours and then we're going to have a 30 minute break or something and somebody even emailed me saying even the NHS amateur radio station has a waiting list <laughs> Yeah, so, that. that's, uh, that's priceless isn't it yeah that's priceless but a couple of really lovely stories we've had over the last 12 months really not just with, with the campaign but it reinforces what we're doing with get on the air to care as there was there were two um two gentlemen who wanted to get their amateur radio license um and one of our key priorities as well is to through the campaign is to reduce loneliness and isolation and these two gentlemen through physical disability and mental health conditions um, were basically housebound um, and couldn't engage um, with communities in the way that you or I would or attend a club to get trained up or whatever um, so the local radio clubs um, actually rallied around for me and arranged through rsgb and um, other colleagues to allow those individuals to 
uh, take their exam at home. This was before Steve started up the remote exam process, but to, uh, to go and support those people to make sure that they were knowledgeable enough to take the test and then to fa facilitate them taking the test and then support them getting some equipment set up. Um, and the one story I'll always um, remember is that um, um, the Stafford and District Amateur Radio Society member went up, their trainer actually went into this one gentleman uh, locally in Staffordshire and he took his multiple choice exam or whatever. And when he informed that, that he could, that he'd actually passed his exam, so he can actually say, well, you know, it looks like you've passed your exam. I can't confirm that until it's been, you know, invigilated on, but it looks like you've completed your exam successfully. Um, the gentleman burst into tears. Oh. Um, now he's now in contact with people all over the world from his living room yeah. um, because he's gone through that process and I think we can do a lot more of that to support you know positive mental health and emotional yeah. well-being well that's a lovely story because I, I mean there's no question about it that you know uh, the damage that COVID has done in destroying families and deaths and I mean it's I, there, there really aren't any words to say how vicious this has been but of course there is the the aftermath of this of people who've been in lockdown um you know whose mental health has suffered who haven't coped well with with isolation i imagine that uh, steve this kind of contact has been a lifesaver I, I would imagine so um i certainly like to agree with paul that um, you know some people who who are house bound normally then rely on amateur radio for outside contact so that that's kind of what gave us the idea for this um but it but it's about the social isolation but about trying something different as well just to keep the the mind active um certainly no expert in those sort of areas but i i do know that people have, have relied on amateur radio for outside contact you know in some cases yeah. Um, yeah. yeah it would be it would be really a, a terrific if we could have sort of more of the inside thoughts of people who have been using Mm. amateur radio during the lockdown and, and yep. what it's meant to them talking to people around the world yeah i was i mean as, as i mentioned at the beginning you know when i was over uh with you when uh, i was just uh, blown away by the the power of the words nhs uh on uh, radio communication and people i remember this guy said to me are you really the nhs you know and i said well yeah i am actually <laughs> all of it it's me <laughs> with the and, NHS and call sign and I think Simon that. Stevens or Sir Simon Stevens as he is now uh, who's the chief executive of the NHS when we met him Paul he was quite surprised as well wasn't he yeah and thank you for that because um, we're aware that um, you know he, Sir Simon bless him he's, he, he can't really get into uh, promoting or supporting individual things um, but thank you to you Roy I'm, I'm in no doubt whatsoever um, we had that wonderful photo of him holding up the yeah, GB1 well, NHS call sign <laughs> we did thrust a great bit of cardboard with the, with the logo in front of him and he said what's this I said no my son smile it's the NHS and he dutifully smiled, which was a... a yeah. John, I'm absolutely sure nobody else except you could have done that. Though, right? <laughs> he can't give me the sack, can he? Um, John, how are we doing? Uh, we, I know we've got a, some interest. Do you want to draw together some threads? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little quiet, but um, if you've got questions, do please uh, send them in now through the Q&A facility. But I'll start off, if I may. Um, could you just uh, tell us, how do people get involved with the hobby and GB1 NHS if they just want to start what what how do they do that is there a website or is there a phone number or how do they do it with social media tell us please Paul mine <laughs> yeah go for it Steve okay. all right um, so um, the RSGB's website rsgb.org is the place to go to and you can see their details of how you get started um, how you study and how you uh, take the exams that is the, the very simplest, easiest way to find out. Um, Paul, I don't know what you, do you want to say anything about GB1 NHS at that point? Well, he's the, yes. he's the only one with the course, that call sign, isn't it? You can only use that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, if they, if they want, if anybody wants to um, get in touch and, um, you know, have a, a discussion about why we're using uh, Amateur Radio for the NHS and how we use it, uh, please um, go to uh, gb1nhs.uk um, and click our contact details and you can 
come straight through to me on email or uh, use at GB1NHS on Twitter and uh, I can pick that account up as well. Yeah, you have a good, you have a good following uh, on Twitter. Well, uh, guys, I, you know, I, I, Steve, I think first of all, we need to thank you, Steve, for having the uh, courage to give us uh, NHS One or GB Golf Bravo One November Hotel Sierra um, in the first place. That was a visionary bit of foresight. Well done, Paul. I think for for having the idea in the first place and make it happen. Uh, and well done, as I think as well. You know, Steve, for the way you've adapted and innovated to cope with uh, the requirements of lockdown and making it easier for people to pass their exams and participate and thank you both for having the the vision of in involving people who are in lockdown and you know we can only imagine how what a lonely experience that can be for some people and we hope that they've uh, they've found uh, new friends around the world that they never knew existed um i think it was um you launched i think on world amateur radio day didn't you back on the uh, the 18th of april and uh, it really is an innovative global community. So thank you both. So if you want to get in touch uh, with the Radio Society of Great Britain, it's just tell us again, Steve, the website address is? rsgb.org. And uh, Paul, you'll get in touch with Paul there by uh, clicking the, uh, the, the, the email contact. So gentlemen, thank you both. Um, thank you, Roy. It's, it's a great pleasure. I must well, see if that can... We've just, just got one problem. more question that's just come in from Tim. Sorry to interrupt you, Rob. Tim's just coming with a question just quickly. Does GB1 NHS have a regular national network? No, we don't have a, a regular scheduled network at the moment. Um, it is something, actually, I've had a couple of people mention that. Um, so it is going to be something that we look to put on um, uh, just to just to give people an opportunity to wear the call sign and personally uh, for me to get the call sign on the air more really so we predominantly focused on special events so far but I think uh, just a regular scheduled net uh, to try and encourage people um, to to kind of take part in the hobby and also what I'd like to do is just to encourage other organizations to see the value of using amateur radio at an organizational level um, and that includes people like the BBC and the police force um, and the, the emergency services nationally not just to have it as a, a sideline for their um, for, for their colleagues as such but to embrace it as part of their core offer core business as usual like like we've done with the NHS I, I think John we've got another question we're just uh, just about as we're about to close yeah I just, well I've just answered it actually it's what age range of radio amateurs is this something that interests young people too and I've I've taken your example of the 11 year old hosting a, a, a sort of a, a discussion so yes it does I guess is the answer yeah there's people of all ages that come into it. Some people come into it early and they drop away from it and they come back to it later. Um, it, it's one of those hobbies that can stay with you through life uh, because it changes as technology changes. Great. Uh, well, uh, so your task, Paul, is to get a regular network broadcast going. Uh, I will do. I'm going to see if I can pass the, uh, the entrance exam and then I might uh, uh, invest 25 quid to see who I can talk to. Um, we'll it, hold you to that, Roy and John. Right. <laughs> oh, um, it, yes, we'll have a new company asset. It'll be a shortwave radio <laughs> communicator. Listen, uh, it's been a really fascinating uh, 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 half an hour uh, talking to you guys. I had uh, I had no idea. I think any of us did, did we? That uh, you know the nooks and crannies of the NHS are so so interesting to explore. So thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. And uh, I'm going to say good night. <laughs>
to be talking about hearable tech because this is a big topic and something that I think in 2021 is going to be is going to be big news. And I think uh, we have a pretty impressive panel today in terms of those working really directly in that focus space of ear-based technology. So I'm really delighted to uh, introduce the panel. Just before I do that, uh, if you want to get in touch with anyone on the panel, you can find their details at thrivewearables.com slash giant2020, or you'll be able to also find them on the giant website. So please do get in touch with the speakers if you want to ask them questions about what, what you're seeing today and what, what you're hearing from them about what they're up to. Um, there will be plenty of time at the end of the session for audience questions. So we're really excited to uh, be taking those questions through the day and uh, listening to some of the answers later on. So please put those questions to the panel and they'll be addressed as um, efficiently as we can at the end of the session today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to, in no particular order, go around and just ask the speakers to introduce themselves today. And I'm going to start with you, Tim. Uh, Tim Antos from uh, Cocoon. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tim Antos, CEO and co-founder of Cocoon. So at Cocoon, we help people sleep and relax easier using audio. Um, so in essence, we um, take um, some of the coaching that you typically get in a, in a sleep clinic um, and make it more accessible to, to, to anyone. So we um, monitor uh, various biometrics and we, we uh, collect various data. Uh, and that enables us to deliver personalized coaching, um, so CBTI-based coaching to help people improve their sleep um, and, and, and get more from their, their downtime. Um, so we've got two products, um, our Night Buds product, which is a tiny in-ear product, um, and then uh, our Relax product, which is a, a larger over-ear product. Um, you can actually check out our Night Buds products now. Um, we, we've just launched that neat new product um, just search nightbuds.co um, and you'll be able to find some exciting information on, on that product. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. And um, Pauline O'Callaghan from Hearable Labs. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, so, yeah, I'm Polly. I'm founder of Hearable Labs and we develop innovative technologies for hearables. We also provide engineering services to companies developing hearables, um, be it startups or um, established companies that are branching into that segment. Um, and my background is electronic engineering and I started the company about two years ago. Previous to that, I'd been developing a hearable device and I realized as probably everybody here has that there are a lot of engineering challenges to overcome. Um, with hearables from making the hardware really, really small to fit in your ear, making it work in real time on a very small battery and, and just having that really nice user experience, great audio um, that people expect from their headphones. So I started Hearable Labs with the idea that we would solve some of these engineering challenges for companies so that more hearables can get to market because I really believe there's a, a huge um, potential impact that they could have on, on people's health and people's lives. So, and I, I think the other panelists here are really the leaders in um, that field today. So I'm really excited to be part of this. Fantastic, thanks, Polly. Um, Johannes Krauser from uh, Cosinus, please introduce yeah. yourself. Yeah, my name is Johannes Kreuzer. I'm, I'm the founder and the CEO uh, from, from Cosinus and we develop products in the year uh, was uh, measuring medical grade um, vital parameters, um, SpO2 level, oxygen, uh, oxygen saturation, temperature, um, heart rate, respiration rate. Um, at the moment, we have a very big study with COVID patients who are monitored at home uh, with our devices. Um, so it's a remote patient monitoring system. We also transfer the data coming from the ear to the clinic and then they can take care about it. We are now a medical company, a medical certificated company, and this is the main focus in our, it's the sensors and how to get uh, the best signals out of the sensors. Fantastic, and I can, uh, I can certainly endorse um, your technology as well. We've, we've had it in the lab and, and, and looked at that in detail. So really great to have you on the panel. Um, Alan Davis from New Hero. 
Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Uh, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, my name's Alan Davis from New Hera. Uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer, so I'm responsible for all the product development activities in the company. Uh, New Hera is a hearing hearables company, so we, we really focus on the hearing aspect of hearables and trying to provide a lot of hearing function in, the, in, in devices. Uh, we're not we're not really targeting trying to be a hearing aid, so we're not we're not really a hearing aid, but we are kind of your first hearing device. Um, so that throws up a lot of really interesting challenges around trying to provide hearing enhancement. How do you personalise for your ears and that sort of thing? We have um, we have about three products that we've developed, and and our latest one, uh, our Max product, uh, just was listed as one of the top 100 inventions of 2020 by time. So, so we're, we're really excited by that, but yeah, we, we think the hearing space is still huge and has a lot, lot of, a uh, lot of innovation to go. Yeah. Congratulations on that, Alan. Fantastic achievement for, for your company and for, for the hearables sort of qualifying it as a, as a thing, I suppose, and the public are going to catch up eventually. So we're just going to keep plugging. Um, I'm going to start with you, Tim, because we've be, we've known each other quite a while, and and I remember talking to you way back when when you were talking about EEG and sleep. Um, so that's a brainwave measurement for those who don't understand what EEG is. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I always I always had this sort of frustration with EEG. Somebody who has worked on the sensors before and found very few applications for those signals um the brain is very complex eeg is pretty simple tell us how you've kind of leveraged that signal for what you do because it's uh, to me a real killer combination um uh, in terms of the sleep and the and the brainwave side of things yeah so um uh but basically our kind of key goal is to get as much insight as and as accurate insight as we can about how that, how that individual's um, relaxing, um, falling to sleep, and then how they're sleeping. Um, and, th and that really kind of helps us um, kind of understand that individual. Um, so EEG is obviously um, a really good technology for, for measuring, measuring sleep. Um, we've we've actually kind of expanded our uh, our measurements. So we use a a number of different parameters um, that we then combine to get a a total um, kind of uh, a holistic view of, of various sources of data to to give a more robust data. Because one of the things in the consumer space is that um, it's very uncontrolled, and people will wear things in different ways. Uh, and we just need to ensure that we have robust data. Um, and EEG is one of these technologies that that, that can be very good, and it, it it and it can also have have poor signal. Um, so what we do is we combine uh, a number of biomarkers um, to to really um, get, the, get the best spread of data. Um, so our current night buds product is is looking at um, heart rate, heart rate variability. Um, uh, as well um, and combining that to really build a picture of that individual how they're sleeping and, and what's going on and I, I really think that the, the move um, into the natural habitat of the individual is one of the key things because it's it's very I don't know if you've ever done a sleep study but it's it's incredibly intrusive when you've got kind of stuff glued to your head wires hanging everywhere it's it's just incredibly unnatural um, and we may not be at the, you know, we, we, we come close to, but we're not at that clinical level of accuracy. But, but what we are able to do is, is, is collect a lot more data over a much, much wider time period in a more natural setting. Um, and we actually find that in, incredibly powerful um, in, in helping us kind of um, optimize and improve that, that individual's um, challenges. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm going to come back and, and ask you about data a bit later on. I think, um, Johannes, you 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 you're, um, you you have a lot of sensors involved in what you do. You're looking at signals and measuring them in a very rigorous and scientific way. Almost um, not to be unfair to him, but at the other end of the spectrum, where the user experience side of things and the kind of productization side of things have not had to take hold, and that obviously introduces compromises. And as you said, you're 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 not. Um, at that sort of 
bleeding edge scientific level. And how, how do you find um, sensors are moving on, um, Johannes, in terms of uh, what you can measure in the ear, the sort of uh, qualification against gold standards? Where, where, where is the ear at when it comes to measurements? Yeah, so, so I would say the ear is one of the best places to measure. Um, of course, you can't measure there everything. Um, ECG, for example, is um, it's not really a good place, but everything else, starting with core temperature, if you want to monitor body core temperature, the ear is one of the best places or convenient places. Of course, there are some internal probes and something like that, but um, SPO2, every optical measurement, it's a, it's the best place inside the ear. Um, it's dark inside. You don't have muscles. You don't have a lot of movements. And even you don't move your head a lot. For example, all the wrist watches, you're, you write on the keyboard, you write, you're uh, doing movements, and you move your head very slow um, and not so much. Um, so this is why it's a very good starting point for all the, the measurements. And this is why, why we get there also much higher quality um, out of this data. That's, and even in a, uh, at a place where it's not, um, the, the user or the wearer is not so disturbed um, because we are used to have something in the ear. We are used to have um, yeah, something at the ear, whatever. Um, it's not a patch where you have to stick it somewhere and something like that. So this is why um, it's a very good place on the one side. It's a one place where you get a lot of data and where you also then can extract out of this data a lot of more parameters. Um, so that's why I, I am I'm, uh, sure that it's one of the best places there um, to measure. It's interesting though. So I, I guess, Polly, maybe I'll ask you this question. Uh, why, why hasn't the hearable taken over in a deeper way so far? Is it to do with engineering challenges? Is it to do with uh, you know, sensors not being small enough? What, what, why hasn't the ear become kind of bigger, quicker? Yeah, I think um, there's been a really big barrier there in terms of um, startups getting into the hearables game. There's been some really interesting Kickstarters over the years um, and other crowdfunding campaigns for hearables, but most of the time um, you don't see them actually even getting to make their product because they've underestimated how much the engineering challenges are. So that means that, um, you know, aside from a small number of new companies who can actually get hearables to market, you're relying on the older and bigger and more established companies, which are always slower to move. Um, but I think, yeah, I agree with you that over the next year or so, um, it's going to get really interesting because I think more and more those engineering challenges are getting smaller. And I think the more we can um, get like even the playing field and lower those barriers to entry, the more interesting um, hearables we'll see come from all directions, not just from the established players. And uh, I think we'll see hearables take hold more than. Yeah, I mean, it's, yes, it's an incredible feat of engineering to do anything in that form factor, just because I'm a bit Absolutely. of a dinosaur when it comes to engineering. And, you know, I've just seen these, these things shrink and shrink. It's absolutely astonishing. I mean, I guess there are other, there are other reasons things are, are opening up. Of course, Apple's products have, have paved the way to a great extent, although, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're not exactly cutting edge relative to what's going on in the space. Uh, but there's, there's other things like regulations as well. I guess, Alan, you've benefited from, from things in the US uh, changing. Is that, is that fair to say in terms of opening up the hearing aid market, for example? Yeah, I mean, there, there is regulatory change happening in the US. It's, um, it's kind of been announced, but it hasn't been enacted yet. So they have new OTC regulations, so people can purchase hearing aids uh, over the counter. Um, there, are, there are ways people sell hearing aids over the counter already over there, but uh, we, we think that regulation is going to create a new market for people looking for uh, entry-level hearing devices. So w when that comes along, so it, ha it hasn't actually been put in place yet. Uh, but we, we think you're going to see hearing devices in retail shelves and much more accessible 
and much better user experience as well so people can buy these and set them up themselves rather than the, the traditional audiological uh, approach. Um, on j Just circling back to the sensor topic, Jacob, um, I, d I think also that the wrist is uh, a little bit different as well and, and it's perhaps a factor of how long you wear the product um, because uh, so, sometimes on the, you know, you can wear your watch all day, but hearables are very situational at the moment. They don't have the battery life yet to be worn all day. They only, they only have, you know, five, six, maybe seven hours for for some products, and people people kind of take them on and off. So I think I think that's also just just to jump into that last question because I had some thoughts while while you you were talking about it. But um, I think that's yeah, that's also a factor that driving. Um, the adoption of those, some of those technologies, and as a battery life gets better, we're going to see uh, th those things happen. I think it's tantalising, isn't it? Kind of every every facet of wearable tech seems to need kind of just about double the battery. Um, and so, from yeah. a physics point of view, that's not sort of <laughs> monumental, but um, it does really feel like that battery equation, you know, is is there throughout all of the discussions I have with with where or virtually all of them, you know, unless the form factor is particularly conducive. So yeah, I mean, I can imagine with a hearable technology, you've got yeah really serious demands on that battery. But I guess we are seeing quite a bit coming from industry in terms of low power silicon, for example, which you know five six years ago was just not a thing relative to where it's at now. So there is there is, there is a convergence, I suppose, between those two things. Um, so going back to your your point about situational and and kind of people wearing sporadically and, and therefore maybe interrupting data sets, I would say for a start, probably the data sets you get even in that case are considerably better than you would traditionally with people you know, doing spot measurements of their health parameters, for example. But anyway, they're not wearing those things all the time. You, you do see a lot of people wearing Apple products all the time, the Apple earbuds all the time. Is it going to be a thing in the future where people are just constantly augmented when it comes to their hearing? Because it's fairly low friction, isn't it, to have those things in? And as long as you're getting the right social interactions and you've broken that barrier, you know, wearing of glasses is is a thing that people do for eight, ten hours a day. You know, it's will it get to that stage? I I, I think we're going to see that. Um, if you look at hearing aids, the big difference between a hearable product like ours and a hearing aid is actually how how you wear it and how long you wear it for. A hearing aid has been designed to be worn all day, and the technology and the power usage in those is really incredible. They have really leading um, low power electronics in those devices, and they've managed to make them run all day. And nowadays they're rechargeable, and they do have uh, Bluetooth and wireless connectivity in them. So I, th I think we're going to see those two things converge, and and maybe um, those devices have been really focused on hearing, but later. Um, we're going to see some really interesting products from from hearables companies that are, that are going to bring convergence there and provide different options. And uh, your point, Jacob, about um, yeah, the data sets are going to be better than just spot measurements. I think that's an important one as well, because yeah, definitely at the moment and maybe even in the future, hearables won't be something that you'll have on twenty four seven or even maybe twelve hours a day. But if you take, for example fertility tracking um like i know women who wake up every morning and take their temperature and write it in an app and aside from the user experience of that they're just getting one data point a day and they use it to manage this big aspect of their health so if you like what johannes is working on with the measuring core body temperature inside the ear um if you're for example sleeping with something like that in that's a game changer for for women yeah, that's no, really interesting. So I was going to go on to this data thing because I had a question for Tim, really. I think probably you've got one of the longest data sets uh, of, of, of all the panelists today, potentially. I'm, I'm speculating. But you've been you've been taking data from, you know, sleep conditions for a long time. What what sort of what stuff's coming along on the back of that knowledge and insight from that, that data? Yeah, so so our, our big thing is really helping people with life challenges that, that they have. So, you know, I, I'm struggling with, with too much stress or I'm struggling to improve my sleep or I have issues with, with sleep. Uh, and what we're really able to do is is take quite um, a, you know, it, it, it 
it does have data, but um, you know, sleep science um, it is quite you know established and solid, and we're able to take this this quite established and solid um, science and apply big data to it to really optimize the details, the the nuances in how to help someone with their challenge because we have a much bigger data set and we can see, right, you know, trying this little thing or, or, or doing this exercise is more effective than this exercise. So we're much, uh, you know, we're, we're able to apply big data to the challenge of helping someone with 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 those challenges. And, and, and that's just something that's not been able to do before to get, um, you know, data sets on the level that you need. You know, you need to wire up thousands of people for for multiple days to, to get kind of comparable data sets. And, and this is why kind of what we're doing, we, we really hope to push the science forward as well as, um, you know, taking what, what's already there to to customers. You know, we, we also want to, to, to help push it forward. And, and this is why our kind of sleep scientists are so excited because they've never had so much data to use to, to, to help with these, these challenges. Um, and, and, and just rewinding back a little bit, you know, with, with Cocoon, um, you know, we, we are really pushing for as close to the, the kind of clinical standards of accuracy as possible. But, you know, it, it's just about kind of realism with ourselves. Um, you know, we we know we're not going to get to that, that, lab, that lab level, but we can get very close to that lab level. And, you know, we, we're regularly comparing against kind of clinical gold standards and continuing to push push that thing, and I think that's where some of the most exciting advances have been in in sensor sensor advances of late. Is how how much closer we've been able to get to that 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 gold standard way way of measuring um, over the last kind of four or five years that 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 we've been really focusing on that. Um, so it, it's really exciting just to see how how accurate our our latest devices are. Yeah, that's no, fantastic. I mean, I'd love to. I'd love to talk more, maybe uh, offline about about that, but the uh, the data set and, and where you're going with it. Johannes, um, broadening this out a bit, what what are the other application areas in um, in the ear? I see that you're working in the epilepsy space. You know, are there are there, are there some obvious sort of low hanging fruit applications that really should be um, happening in the ear, as it were? That's a good question. Um, so, um, so there are a lot of things which are, let's say, the combin combination of several sensors, or even uh, let you say you use the temperature for detecting fever, or like Polyzet for uh, tracking fertility, something like that. And what we see, it's always the combination of several requirements, or something like that but they lead more or less to the same um, devices or the same products, which is quite good because we have the, the big advantage. We have four of the five vital parameters um, and on the five, uh, fifth, we are working on it. Um, and they are the standard parameters. What you, when you go to your doctor, when you go to a clinic, if you have an accident, they will take the vital parameters. That's the first thing that they will do. Um, and then they use it because you had an accident or they use the temperature for fertility tracking or they use something like that. But this is the, the big advantage. And I also, uh, I agree with Tim. So sometimes you don't need this lab accuracy or something like that. So this very um, unusual setting or something like that, but you get the real life and you get the data real life and long time and something like that. And for example, as what we have now with the with the with the COVID patients, um, they are monitor, they are at home, they are having more or less the real life. Um, of course, they are ill, but um, and the doctors were not used to it. They were used to it that the patient is sitting, he's not moving, he's not talking, he's nothing doing. And then they get a measurement, so the accuracy of the SpO2 level or something like that, it's quite good. And if the patient was moving, he said, please don't move. And now this patient is walking around, they only see the data, they don't know 
know what happened. They don't know um, why something happened or something like that. Um, and this is um, this is what now changed. So that um, and this is also with epilepsy and something like that. You will never get in this real life um, the highest accuracy. This is not possible because people are moving and something like that. Um, but you need the context information and then it's possible to have a much better overview about the patient, about uh, the treatment or about the illness and something like that. And this is, I think, what changed. And then you will have a lot of more application where you can use hearables, where you can use sensors in the ear, if it's for epilepsy or if it's for um, uh, sepsis detection, um, something like that. And then you have all the firefighters, the army and all the workers who are in a, a dangerous environment. And there are a lot of applications which are then able on this technology. Mm. That's really interesting. I, I think, yeah, I love the idea that you've got those, those critical measures all there to play with, uh, with this sort of application yeah. area that spans out from there. And it just sort of highlights just how little progress has been made so far and what the opportunity is, I guess. Um, so I'm really, um, as I said at the beginning, really excited to see where it goes. I want to I talk about um, the bigger picture, I suppose. So we've got wearables, we've got hearable technologies in the ear. How can we start to kind of imagine a network of things? So augmenting those technologies with other things. We talk to some of our clients when we're talking about kind of care in the home applications, about having other parts of a wearable ecosystem. So you kind of imagine an out of box experience, which is plug something into the mains, put something on your body, and for that to be automatically connected and working. So in particular cases where people have uh, neurodegenerative diseases, for example, it may be really, really beneficial to just have a really super simple out of the box experience and everything's working all configured completely no wi-fi password all that sort of stuff are there other ways broader than that 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 hearables can kind of start melting into the the landscape of technology in a in a, in a sort of um quite organic way and, and what are the sort of technologies that might enable that it's a bit of a broad question but has anyone got any thoughts on that kind of subject I think one of the advantages of um, having something in your ear is the, the data that you can get from your other wearables. So <clears throat> if I'm wearing um, yeah, a patch like to detect my sugar levels or something like that, um, okay, I might have an LED or something, but I can't really get data from that in real time and understand what it means without looking at a screen. And um, yeah, this is, this is one of the things anyway that I, I hope hearables will achieve is to kind of undo us from our screens a little bit where we can be more heads up actually present in our environment with just a layer of extra information via audio <clears throat> but i think yeah so for example if i'm wearing this sugar level sensor and um my sugar level spikes because of something i ate an hour ago and okay i could look at the app sporadically or or maybe get a push notification but it would be really nice to have something natural in the background where, you know, maybe from the field of auditory display and hearing um, a certain level of background kind of beep or, or something like this that tells me when my sugar level has spiked so that at the same time I can kind of assess how my body feels like, am I, am I tired? Or am I full of energy? And does that have something to do with my sugar levels where it's not this, I need to look at a screen and process the information and think about what that means, but it's this more natural in the background. Oh, I like almost like feeling something happened in your body. You just hear that your sugar level spiked. And uh, so I think that's where hearables can um, kind of join and, and become a network with other wearables and, and provide advantages in that way. It's challenging, isn't it? The, uh, the sort of notion of interruption and, and when you're in a social setting and you're engaging in that context, it seems like a long way away where an, a wearable or a hearable can actually kind of be sensitive to that and to be interrupting that conversation to tell you about that other thing and, and I think that's probably one of the challenges with things like smart glasses and how much of a flop kind of Google Glass was for multiple reasons but that kind of interruption and that sort of sense of like are you with me or are you with your technology 
So I think the challenge, the UX challenge and the sort of, I mean, Alan, you must have kind of a whole load of thinking around this stuff because you're, you're kind of designing a, a system that inherently is continually partially interrupting, interrupting to some degree. It's, it's kind of augmenting and, and flavoring and tempering mm. your hearing. Do, do you, I mean, turning to that actually and, and sort of going back to the augmentation thing that I was talking about, I, I know you've got other things that are non-hearable as well that are in your ecosystem. How do you kind of manage all of that stuff from that perspective and then from the user experience side of things and the, and the sort of um, sensitivity to social stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, you know, the, the, you know, the killer app for the ear is hearing stuff, right? So it sounds obvious, but sometimes it's easy to forget. And, and uh, we, we, we do build out some, Kind of we call them accessories, but they're, they're really ways to interact with your environment in in different ways. So, um, one of one of the things we we provide is uh, something that allows you to connect your hearable straight to your TV, and hear the sound coming straight out of your TV. And it's not uh, it's a bit different to other things out there in that there's no pairing required. So it has a it has a really different user experience. You you access it through an app and you just tap on it and then all of a sudden you can hear your TV clearly, uh, and that that's kind of a way to put your hearing, you know, focused onto the TV or, or whatever it is you wanted to do. And I think that's that's kind of a generic concept and can be very much extended to all your smart speakers around your home and you can start asking yourself questions about well, okay. Um, many years ago, I would have had one microphone in my home, which is my, you know, in my telephone, right? Nowadays, you probably got you probably got fifty microphones in your house or more, uh, and they might be able to help you hear better, right? If you can tap into those in a smart way, and and if you can figure out the usability for that, and how your hearing might follow around these things in the room, and you can use them to actually augment and improve what you're hearing, because instead of having two ears now just on your head. You've got 50 around your house that can do all sorts of things. So uh, I think that's going to be a huge growth area for, for hearables and there's some real like, incredible potential that, that can be had there, but some amazing technological challenges to solve there and, and usability challenges as well. I'm just, just trying to figure out what it should be doing when is, is you know, one of, one of the bigger problems, right? You can probably get the tech working already, but, but making it actually seamless and, and usable and useful um is probably another another challenge yeah and, and, and just 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 to add to that i i think kind of you know i i can see a world where you know that this this kind of a standardized quality of data that 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 you can get out there from these different sources um and you know our, our long-term ambition with cocoon is not to be tied to devices it, it's to basically be a company that process data of that individual in the real world and give them personalized coaching um, based on that data. And, you know, kind of right now we, we have to make the devices because there's, there's not the accuracy in, in, in the other metrics out there that there's, there's not the kind of controlled way of delivering it. But, you know, we, we, we're looking forward to a world where we're not constrained to our devices where, you know, we, we can work with many different devices and, uh, and we can get the kind of level of of insight that we need and and deliver it back um so so that that's the kind of the world that we're looking forward to um because really we're a feedback loop we're a kind of control system where you know we're learning about the individual uh and then kind of uh you know speaking to them and and and, and giving them insights back um yeah mm, it's fascinating i, I, I mean it I can imagine it's a little way off in terms of what you got. Oh, it's a long way off, yeah. Because of user experience issues, not not least. I mean, your your product is inherently designed to to be slept in, um, whereas many others will not be, I guess. Um, so, Johannes, on that on that note, around uh, sort of where 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 the uh, where the hearable stops and where other things start, I suppose. You know, what, what what's the limit of what we're able to do with the signals that are coming from the sensors in the ear, batteries, all this stuff's been talked about. There's also the data transport side of things. You know, networks are not what they could be. Um, will they ever be there? Ubiquitously, unlikely for some time. 
5G is going to solve all of our problems. You know, where, where, where are we at with, um, with getting the, that information out of the ear and how yeah. much can we kind of process on board, as it were, at this stage? Yeah, so um, at the moment, it's, let's say it's really this distributing the data. Um, it's, of course, we can, we can measure a lot. We can, uh, we also increase the, the runtime, we increase the battery uh, capacity and something like that. But at the end, um, sometimes, of course, you can use the ear for the information. So you get a beep or you get a sound or uh, something like that. But normally you want to trans transfer the data because normally you also have to visualize the data. Um, so the user, the doctor, or who else wants to see the data and not hear the data. Um, and then, of course, you're normally uh, at the moment, you use Bluetooth, uh, which is quite good, but it's also limited. If you go to 5G, then the power, uh, it's the other problem. Um, so normally, um, it's this typical Bluetooth to Wi-Fi, Bluetooth to something um, other. Um, you need some 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 hub, um, and if you then, uh, so this will be, I guess, in the next years still a challenge. Um, that at the year it has to be small. It has to be very small. Um, so you can't. Uh, you so normally you need some kind of uh, hub for the data. Um, but at the end, it would be quite good if, let's say, every um, smartphone can receive my data and then tr transferring it to my data, uh, to my database or something like that. So normally, it's always my data is coming to my smartphone. If my smartphone is not there, um, it's lost or it's stored there or something like that. But there are so many um, devices around who can receive on the one side Bluetooth signals and on the other side transfer to, to a server. So that's what I hopefully, but I'm not sure if it really will happen, um, that there I'm sending the data and it will go to, uh, to my cloud solution or something like that. But I don't know why or which hub it was going, um, of course privacy, encryption, and something like that. That's a big challenge then. But at the end, it would be very nice because this is normally the, the real challenge when you are at the ear, um, yeah, the transfer to, to a cloud solution or something like that. Um, and then, of course, with medical, uh, in real time, medical grade, with everything related there. Um, but at the end, it, yeah. I guess it could help a lot because when I have an accident, my data is <laughs> in the clinic and they know what to do um, and they can do something like that. So, and if I'm sleeping, if I want to track my fertility, everything, it's the same, uh, the same setting, but you need the data, uh, not at your ear, you need the data somewhere else. So, that, okay, let's be um, contentious then. What about smartphones? You know, we, 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 we sort of use this horrible thing that's the user experience is terrible. It's kind of bulky, and you know, in I like to imagine in at some point in time, I won't give a particular point in time, but at some point in time, I see I see that disappearing. And we talked about using the hearing as a as an interface. Um, what? Okay. Well, first of all, starting with the smartwatch. You know, this this is a sort of move in the right direction to some degree. We've got a screen, we've got better sensors in a smartwatch than we have in a smartphone. So we've got health implications with a smartwatch, but there are some obvious problems. Would it be the, would it be possible for us to kind of move towards ears and potentially glasses as, as the killer kind of combination for all of our connectivity needs? Polly, what, uh, help, help me out with that. Can we get rid of the smartphone? Um, I, I don't think we'll get rid of us, and not anytime soon anyway, but um, definitely I'd like to see us reduce our reliance on it. And it's interesting you bring up smartwatches. I think in some ways they're worse because like what you said earlier about when you're in a situation with somebody and you're, you're looking at your screen and they're wondering if you really want to be there or if, if you're somewhere else. And I find when you're with somebody who has a smartwatch and they keep looking at it, it's this very strange thing where 
what it used to mean when somebody looked at their watch was they really need to be somewhere or they're they're bored or they're they're not interested in being where they are um but yeah i think there are definitely um a lot of apps that could be translated or transferred from the the visual domain into the audio only domain um there are a lot that can't as well because for example if you glance at your smartphone you can see immediately what time it is what's the date what your battery life is who texted you what's on your calendar like you can see that and process it almost immediately because the the visual to to mental path there is like very very quick whereas with audio um it's slower and it's it's lower bandwidth so the same information might be battery 70 percent and you know this kind of thing that you get with audio at the moment but then I mentioned earlier the field of auditory display where you transfer um, data from being in this uh, spoken or or written form and into a series of kind of beeps and boops or different things that you can more naturally understand, like a kind of audio shorthand. So I'd really like to see um, apps, yeah, starting to be transferred over into the the audio only domain, the, the ones that can. So like navigation or being able to control your hearing device so you can um, change what you're hearing in a certain setting like choose which direction you want to hear from or choose which hearing profile or or boost the the bass or whatever it is and that you can do that without having to get out of your present environment and enter this other world but to just just adjust it on the go. That's fascinating I love the idea of kind of yeah getting around that bandwidth as you call it that that limitation of between visual and and uh, audible have you got um stuff that you do with what you're working on alan in terms of a kind of layered and multifaceted approach to audio or is it just about the hearing and the the, the sound as it were from the environment yeah we do we do have a bit of a multifaceted approach because our products are a bit different from traditional hearables where, you know, generally you you have that, you know, a lot of hearables product talk about transparency and it's off off most of the time. You have to enable it. But our products is kind of on because hearing's the the first application and, and music and phone calls and that sort of thing are kind of the second application. Um so so our products are always layering the the phone call and the music and those sort of things together with your uh you know, your environmental sound. And in, in a way that the systems that do that a little bit artificial at the moment because you hear, a, you, you know, you hear a sound that's being presented, you know, it's not rendered in your environment, if that makes sense. So, you know, sound generated from around you is, you know, presented in a way that matches what you see. So, you know, it's going to come from a certain direction and you can see that with your eyes and that sort of thing, whereas sound from your devices and, and through the, you know, the audio link is, is presented in a bit of a different way. So, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity there to to really explore how how you do those sort of things and how you create those auditory scenes and and that sort of thing and and I think um, I think Polly's really right there about the bandwidth of of hearing and you know what is the right information to to give through your ears. It's probably not going to be the same as what you present visually, right? You probably want to do something a little bit different there and and find ways to you know aug- augment rather than replace. And they do that in things like airplanes. In an airplane cockpit, the plane talks to you as it's landing, right? So, so pe- people people know, you know, people have found ways to do that, and I think there's probably big scope to do that in hearables still too. Mm. It's, I mean, it's, it feels to me like there are very few technologies which are in any way sensitive to other people beyond the user. So, like smartphones, watches, all of it, it's kind of a distraction from a social interaction. And I haven't really seen a product that kind of pays any attention to any other users apart from the, the one that's right there. And that's not done particularly well in many cases. So it's, um, I think there's a lot of food for sort of thought around and the idea of sort of community yeah, you know, experience as well as, as, as well as your own. Yeah. And, and, on, and on that topic, you know, sounds really interesting thing. Uh, you can kind of close your eyes and not look at something. Uh, and you cannot touch something if you don't want to feel it, and you cannot eat it if you don't want to taste it, but your ears are always on. And traditionally, if you want to present something, you know, in an auditory way, um, without hearables, everyone hears it. 
right? Um, but hearables give you a different way. You can you can provide more personalised information to people now, and, well, and getting back to that kind of all day way. Yeah, less um, less experience for the community. You're, you're actually creating a barrier. So right. that's what I'm saying. But no, you know, it goes both ways. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. Sorry to interject there, Alan, but we're, we're almost at the end of the time. I wanted to kind of ask two things. First of all. Uh, just quickly to go around and see what your biggest challenge is right now. Where where are you at with your work, and what's the thing that you kind of that keeps you up at night? What are, what are you trying to solve right now? Um, let's start with Polly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think funding is always an issue for for startups, and certainly for us. So um, I think yeah, there, there's so many exciting things to work on and to solve in this uh in this area like all the different engineering challenges there's so many opportunities a lot of them we talked about today um so yeah the, the limitation is on how much funding we can get to actually work on them Tim, uh, i mean i'd probably echo that to be honest i think um you know that the the, 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 the the there's so much opportunity there and it's sometimes frustrating at, um the limitations of how fast we can run at these things and it tends to be you know how how tight a team can we can we manage with with, with our runway etc um but yeah um i i think kind of there's so much potential and it's tremendously exciting that i think it's just a matter of time really alan yeah, here was incredibly multidisciplinary, and and to really solve the problems, you have to tick a lot of boxes to make to make good hearables, and that that's that's really a challenge. One one of the things where you know we're always focusing on is the user experience and and bringing like a, an at home hearing experience, and how do you do that? Because that service is traditionally delivered by by audiologists in in a clinic. So so that's one of the things we we focus on really hard, and it's a lot more than the device. There's a lot of human factors that that need to be taken into account and and brought into the hearables and and their journey. So that that's a big focus for us. Fantastic. And uh, Johannes, what's your challenge for 2021? Yeah, the challenge is for us. It's the the let's say the conservative medical market. Um, <clears throat> so the, the medical market it's very slow. Now it's a little bit speeding up uh, based on Corona, but it's the digitalization, the um, openness for new um, new technologies is really, you have to push it and push it. I don't know, we push it since eight years roundabout. And now it's, <laughs> we are at where we say, okay, now we are where we wanted to be uh, seven years ago. Um, so it's really, it's very slow and this is, um, yeah, sometimes a little bit frustrating, but I guess it's now getting better. Fantastic. Well, good luck to all of you. I'm going to ask one final question. Will Apple enter the health tech market this year with um, with a hearable product? I would say they already have. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, with the, the new iOS, um, you can already um, put in your hearing profile and use it adjust the transparency to your own um, hearing profile. So I would say that's a health application. Yeah, fair point. I was, I was probably referring a bit more to sensors and kind of a bigger okay. play, but yeah, no, I get, I, I, I think it's uh, definitely shows a sign, doesn't it? They're going in that direction. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, we, yeah, I mean, we, we, we definitely believe that, you know, at some point they're, they're going to get more sophisticated. Um, with what they do. I think they're typically a, a follower after things are proven out. Um, so, you know, I think they were gonna want to see the the clear use cases, the clear, clear kind of customer, you know, demand for these things. Um, so is that another know, maybe in 221? Maybe I, I, you know, 2021, yeah, I, I really doubt, you know, that they're gonna do anything that's not been done or, or proven out before, but we'll see, you know. There's a fair bit out there though, let's face it. I mean, it's not, it, you know, Philips have got an established um, technology in the market. I've, I've got some in my bag and you, you know, you, you guys are coming out with stuff. So that I think it'll be quite quick. I would say they will come out with something to be honest, but um, I'm putting my neck on the line big time there. <laughs> uh, Alan, what do you reckon? I oh, wouldn't, wouldn't want to speculate there. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> they can do anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'll sit on the fence there. Yeah, they could. Yeah, we. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know what they're gonna do. They're um. Yeah. We'll see. Johannes. We'll see. Yeah, I, I think it's the <laughs> direction where they are leading to. So it's quite obvious, I would say. And the other side, it makes sense. Uh, as our, we'll see where, where it goes. It's um, fantastic to have spoken to you all. I really appreciate your time and uh, for coming on the track today. Um, yeah, as I said at the beginning, we'll have questions coming up next. So hopefully there's some good stuff in the, uh, in the pipeline for that. Um, just to note, all the speakers have their information on thrivewearables.com slash giant2020. If you'd like to go and uh, hook up with them and connect and talk about more of what you've heard today, please do. Uh, but yeah, carry on with questions uh, in the various channels and we'll get over to those straight away now. So thanks again to the panel for today's session. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope for the best, Polly, and just ask you a question whilst we're here, waiting for clarity on how to use this. Uh, but I'm going to ask you this question. Um, listening, listening to your answer on um, on the kind of application side, and we talked a bit about some of the exciting opportunities. Johannes talked about, you know, all the signals in the ears and stuff. I just thought maybe you could tell us a bit about some of the stuff you're working on at the moment and the challenges you're, you're confronting in the lab. Um, yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we're kind of somewhat in stealth mode with the um, with our own products. So we're, we're at the moment providing engineering services to other companies. Um, what I can say is we're based here in uh, Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin and they're experts in micro integration of electronics. So a lot of what we're working on is um, this miniaturization piece and how do you make the electronics small enough to fit into the ear and to um, be able to be molded into different form factors. So it's not just the usual kind of bud that you see now. And that kind of aligns with our um, mission of um, helping more hearables get to market so that if we can provide more options for how you can put these things together, it's not just gonna be the same thing with a different brand on it for every product. It can actually have, there can be some variety in the, in the different types of hearables that we can have and they can be specialized for lots of different things. Mm. So is there is there a kind of bit of, of platform technology that we're going to end up having at some point, like you know something that we, that we use to like a like a smartphone or like a smart watch? There's a certain amount of tech in each of those that's kind of standardized. Are we getting to that point, or is it still very sort of bleeding edge with hearable elements? Yeah, and I think it remains to be seen who will be the provider of that platform. Um, we'll probably see some kind of operating system, but also um, on, on the hardware side. I mean, you have Qualcomm at the moment, they provide quite a, a good platform for hearables um, for companies that aren't Apple and don't have their own chip. Um, so yeah, I, I think we'll start to see that all get built out. It's just at the moment, we're kind of at that inflection point where people are realizing that hearables are, are and true wireless headphones are a really big thing and they're a big consumer product. They're not just a niche product. Um, so I think, yeah, from here on, we'll start to see those platforms being built out. Because there are a few players, aren't there, in the in the space in terms of that sort of uh, algorithm layer, the Encel and WBD and and of course Apple. It's um it's sometimes sort of hard to know uh, you know where it's going to go and and how it's going to consolidate. And I think uh, mm -hmm. I saw some stuff in the news today. I put it onto LinkedIn about this sort of super micro battery technology. Have you heard of this stuff, super capacitor? Right, yeah. Yeah, I, I just saw it yesterday, so I didn't really read the full article. It was amazing, like uh, we were talking, I think, in our session earlier on about um, batteries needing to be half the size, and then all of a sudden I saw this thing. So have you, have you seen much about this super capacitors? Not a lot, um, but yeah, I've, I've heard that that's a direction that that could take us to smaller power supplies. So yeah, as we talked about, batteries are always the, the problem. Like, you know, we're doing this work on miniaturization of electronics and technologies, but uh, on, it's kind of insignificant, some of it, until you can reduce, because the battery is so big compared to everything else, you can reduce all the, the size of all the other electronics, but until you can reduce the battery, um, it, it probably won't have too much effect. So yeah, something like that coming out would be pretty amazing.
Yeah. So I guess you you tend you tend to be using a uh, lithium ion technologies as as the rest of us are. Yeah, lithium ion, lithium lithium polymer. Yeah. Yeah. Johannes, hi. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> Thought he was going to take the pressure off me there for a second. But... No, it's all on you. <laughs> I, I was I was uh, I saw Alan was in the um in the other room as well, so I was expecting Alan to be with us. Um, but. I'm not entirely sure. Um, just bear with me a sec. I think we might have um, got to two o'clock, so we may have, we may be able to dodge a bullet here. I think because um, I think probably the next session is starting. So I'm not sure if people can hear us, but thank you uh, to Polly for for stepping in and, and answering some questions. And um, enjoy the rest okay. of the show, everyone. So hello everyone, thanks for joining our track on wearables redefining healthcare. We're delighted to be back at the Giant Health Show again this year for the third year running. And we have five sessions of really exciting speakers lined up for you. We're taking the round table format, so we'll have a person chairing the session and we'll talk around a theme for each of the sessions. And, uh, and we'll have a, spe a section at the end of that for questions where you guys can all um, link into us and, uh, and ask us questions and we'll put those to the panel live um, on the day of the show. So um, we are a design and development company and Thrive have been working around the world of health and wellness for quite some time and working on wearable technologies has really gone through some incredible changes over the last few years. And we're really excited to be now um, at a point where we're really having impact and creating some wearable technology products um, that really help to um, enhance people's lives and to um, provide provide uh, preventative and predict predictive healthcare opportunities. Um, if you want to connect with us or any of the speakers at our sessions, please go to thrivewearables.com slash giant2020, where you can get information about all the speakers and connect with our team and with the team um, who are involved with the show. Um, this session coming up today is called Muscle Stimulation for Rehabilitation and Recovery. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Barbara Shepherd to introduce and to run that panel discussion today. Uh, Barbara is the Head of Business Engagement at Manchester Fashion Institute and the Chair of the Steering Committee of the eTextile Network in the UK. Um, Barbara, welcome to the Thrive Wearables track and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks Jacob um, uh, and um, I'd just like to say uh, to everybody in the audience and the panel it's a real pleasure uh, to be working with uh, the team today. There's expertise across academia and industry uh, which for me is really important because it's a combination of all of all of us working together and hopefully in the audience we'll have members from KTN and Innovate UK because there is funding available for all of us to work collaboratively together to the benefit of the sector. So what I'd um, like to do now is then introduce you to the panel um, and I'll start off first with Dave Sandbach from Thrive. Over to you, Dave. Oh, hi. Uh, yes, I'm Dave Sandbach, Director of Innovation at Thrive Wearables. Um, I've been with the company for four years and uh, I have a personal background going back a long way into the late 90s in um, e-textiles uh, where we overcame problems of putting uh, prototypes into uh, mass production for consumer electronics um, kind of standards, possibly for the first time back in 2001. Um, my name is on a number of patents in that space. Um, at Thrive, at Thrive, we work in tandem with clients and on our own internal innovation. And we've been involved in several uh, very interesting projects in this space. Brilliant, Dave. Um, I'd now like to introduce one of our uh, leading UK academics in this field, uh, Kai Yang from the University of Southampton. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, my name is uh, Kai Yang. I'm a uh, associate professor at the University of Southampton. 
I have uh, worked on electronic textile for over 10 years. Uh, my research focus is really on the electronic textile-based wearable technology for healthcare. Uh, the current project I'm working on is funded by EPSRC. It's an EPSRC fellowship to develop uh, advanced uh, e-textiles for wearable therapeutic. Uh, and the initial application will be for the joint page relief for people with osteoarthritis knee. Uh, before I was a uh, principal investigator of a medical research council funded project called the Smart Move. Uh, in the Smart Move project, uh, we develop a wearable training system for stroke uh, uplift rehabilitation. Um, apart from my academic uh, research, I also have a great passion on the enterprise uh, uh, business because to me, and the main aim of the research is to develop something that can benefit the end user. Uh, I co-founded a company called Smart Fabric Inks, uh, which is a Southampton University spin-out company uh, supply functional inks for print electronics on textile. And I'm also um, founder of a company called uh, eTechSense. eTechSense develop a wearable eTextile for healthcare application. Uh, as Barbara also mentioned, we got the eTextile network, uh, which is a platform to bring together the academia industry and the people in other sectors uh, work together to speed up the innovation in textile. Um, thank you. Fantastic. And last but not least, I've got Phil Konofsky from Chimera. Over to you, Phil. Thanks, Barbara. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Phil Konofsky, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Chimera. I've got a background in electronic engineering and cybernetics with a research focus in uh, wearable technologies. Uh, joined Chimera back in 2015 uh, when it was still a young budding company, and we're uh, since then been developing the new uh, smart garment technologies uh, looking to develop new technologies for biomedical monitoring, uh, all embedded in smart arms. And so we have a research, we have a focus in uh, professional sports and medical applications. That's really where we where we live and where we work. And yeah, it's 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 quite exciting to be part of this panel and discussing a few of the challenges and opportunities for for this sector. Thanks, Phil. That's great. Uh, just uh, a little bit more background on myself. Um, quite different to everybody else on this panel. Um, I'm a garment engineer. I've worked in the sector for over 25 years. I'm late to uh, the, the university uh, industry um, collaboration side. Um, started in university um, later in my career, and I'm really passionate about how we can link what we're doing in terms of research and our academic excellence in the UK to supporting um, our industries, our, many of which are SMEs in the sector. So really keen for anybody out there um, who wants to follow up with me or my team at uh, the Manchester Fashion Institute at Manchester Metropolitan University. So that's everybody on the panel for today. You will have opportunities to um, ask us questions. Any that we can't answer today, we will, we will get back to you. So feel free throughout um, this presentation to upload any of your questions. Um, and I'll, I'll kick off the panel. Um, it's going to be interactive and quite relaxed because we've, uh, we've talked about how we want this to come across to the sector so that it's engaging for you listening but also that you know you get the most out of the session today uh, first question is going to be for you uh, Dave um, you work your business works across lots of different areas um, what what forms of muscle stimulation are, are currently out there now in the sector I'm, I'm, I guess to give it context um, there there is TENS technology, um, which has been out there for a long time, which is a muscle stimulation technology. Um, uh, but we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of change in the space uh, recently with training, um, training aids largely. I think Kai and Phil will both have um, things to say on this subject as well. But uh, we've also done some interesting work recently with mechanical stimulation so using using specific frequencies of mechanical vibration which is also very promising for um kind of well-being applications and pain relief what about you phil I, 
on your side in terms of muscle stimulation and the work you're doing on Chimera? So uh, I guess we, we fall under the more uh, passive technologies with, with what we've been doing. So there's obviously muscle stimulation with, with um, electrical signals. Um, but what we've been doing and what our main technology that's out there at the moment is looking at an infrared emitting technology. So one that's actually, uh, as I said, a passive technology. So it doesn't use any batteries or wires or electronics or things like that, um, but instead uh, absorbs energy, wasted energy from the wear and ambient light from the surroundings and converts it to far infrared, which uh, possibly some audience members uh, will, will uh, recognize that term or, or its use in infrared saunas or infrared therapy lamps. They're quite popular and, and were very popular uh, back in the day for sports rehabilitation. Um, right. And essentially, it's the same principle. You're, you're stimulating the muscle, you're increasing blood flow, you're increasing oxygenation, and you're able to accelerate performance and recovery. And so this is, this is the, the key technology we've been developing. And this is something that's, as I said, out on the market and being used by uh, all sorts of athletes from your Olympic gold medalists all the way to your weekend warriors and people who are just interested in keeping fit, increasing their recovery and just getting better. So Kai, in relation to you then and your academic and your research work, is it really possible to restore function by doing this through muscle stimulation? Is this, you know, from from a research point of view, would you like to discuss to the panel how you feel your work contributes to this area? Uh, yes, the muscle stimulation is uh, a technology or device that has existed for quite a long time. Uh, there's uh, strong clinical evidence uh, says, uh, uh, which which is backed by by clinical trials, say functional electric stimulation. So for FES can restore. Let's see, for example, for the stroke rehabilitation, which is an area I worked on, can restore the uh, arm leg function um, post stroke. Uh, how it works uh, is. Um, also, in a normal situation, healthy um, a human being, we control activity use of brain, but there's evidence actually when you do the movement, even it's artificial movement enabled, for example, FES, there's a signal a build which you can feed back to the brain, which if you do the intensive exercise, um, for a long time, it will build the new link on the brain or damage uh, the brain, which can be re repaired the link. So yeah, so from that aspect, uh, it is uh, it is scientifically backed. Also, um, Nines, uh, which is a uh, UK um, UK body to publish the, the evidence, uh, make recommendation for the NHS to use the technology. Uh, there's also support so FES should be used to uh, restore the the functional activities. Um, from the business point of view, um, there has been many company sell this type of device and there's a lot of patients has benefited by using this device to regain their functions. So I would say there's pretty strong evidence that it works, uh, but like any or, or most of the medical device, even if it works for most people, it uh, doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So that's why the initial assessment session is very important because there uh, we do find a situation in which the um, technology don't, uh, don't work. Uh, so I think uh, it's important in the initial session to assess whether um, this is the right technology, even with uh, people it works, what is the best uh, program to use uh, together with the device to, to um, optimize the treatment. Okay, brilliant. Um, Dave, um... Electro technology is a key priority in the work that your team at Thrive do. How does this uh, requirement to pass current into the body affect the design of high performance electro technologies? Yes, I, I think there's a lot of promise in, in this area. Um, so traditionally, TENS devices, for example, needed a gel or, or a wet electrode to, to pass current into the body. Um, increasingly with silicons and uh, loaded silicons and conductive polymers, uh, 
even um, conductive textiles, it is possible to um, produce products with dry electrodes that will um, safely uh, pass current into the through the skin and and to trigger those neurons that that stimulate the that activate the muscles. Um, it it opens up a a whole new um, set of possibilities in terms of garments and integrating uh, the electrodes into wearable devices uh, and I think we'll maybe come onto it and explore it a little bit further but understanding the position that somebody's um, body is in and the way that they're moving and timing your intervention um, accordingly is um, is sort of particularly promising so these things need to become integrated into clothing to um, to be properly useful and, and roll out as um, into products. Okay, brilliant. Um, another one then, one for you, Phil. Um, in your world of sports tech, um, where Chimera are operating at, at a senior level, are you seeing a need for new recovery approaches? Um, does this cover the day-to-day -day training and performance or is it more about injury recovery for your business? So absolutely, uh, this is something that covers both performance and day-to-day. -day. Um, in, in something like sports where it's so competitive and everyone, all the athletes want that extra bit of edge uh, and just be able to win gold. It's, it's one of those things where you have to look at the entire training regime, uh, almost your entire lifestyle, and look at how uh, you can apply sports tech to improve your performance, improve your recovery. And when we say recovery, um, it's a bit of a technical term in that we're not only talking about injury recovery. Injury is almost the last place you want to be because then you're out for, for several weeks. Your performance naturally might dip or you, if you're not particularly, let's say, younger, you probably won't be able to get to the same peak that you, that you get to. So you want to keep away from injury. So when we say recovery, we're talking about that day in and day out, if you're performing at a maximum level, you know, how does your body recover from that very strenuous activity uh, that you had just performed and being able to go again and again. And the reason you'd want to focus a lot, not just on improving your performance with reps and, and uh, conditioning, but also recovery, is because it's that day-to-day, -day, uh, day in, day out activities that actually builds you up and builds up your performance long-term um, and obviously safeguards you as well from injury. So absolutely, there's, there's always going to be a need for new uh, recovery approaches within the sports industry. Um, and, you know, there are some technologies that's, that come in and out of fashion. Uh, there's a few pseudo technologies that people are interested in and maybe they come in and they're trendy because maybe some athletes uh, use them or what have you, but then they sort of fall out of fashion. Um, so naturally, on this, on, on, in, in this place, having anything that's clinically... Uh, evidence or anything that that is proven to work uh, is is going to be a, a massive benefit, um, and and like electrostimulation being a clinically uh, beneficial technology with many clinical uh, research sort of backing that up, uh, the technology that we've been applying with infrared is also clinically backed, um, and, and again that's how we've been able to access some of the the premiership leagues or the the top national teams because we're coming in not as a potentially a pseudoscience, but something that's actually backed by, by evidence. And that's really worked for us. So um, Kai, Kai then, in terms of muscle stimulation and sensing going hand in hand to create biofeedback, what are your views on the benefits of deploying this? And uh, could, could you give the, the audience some examples of, of how this actually happens? Um, I think, uh, uh, because, uh, Simulation is uh, used to strengthen muscle in general and restore the movement. While on the other hand, uh, the um, the sensory, let's say for example the the ECG, EEG, EMG, um, which you can be used to give the indicate about the biopotential function. By bringing these two together, um, personally, I think the one of the biggest benefit is. Uh, um, it closed the loop. It provides the user how they are getting on with the, with their recovery. Because once somebody told me they were quite exciting when they say actually you can see the the muscle movement. Uh, also, um, he's in the very early stage, uh, wasn't able to 
kind of do the movement uh, um, completely rely on the uh, muscle, but because uh, he saw there's uh, there's kind of start to strengthen muscle, this kind of information is very important to, to the patient because it gives the, them the hope actually there's something change, something is going in the right direction. So that is very good motivation both for, for sports, fitness in general, because we, we, we tend to do more when we know what's going on. And it's a particular, even more important for, uh, for rehabilitation and recovery. Um, some example, for, for example, with the, the FES muscle stimulation, uh, if we say with the EMG work together, it can inform the end user how they are getting on with, the, with their activity, um, the muscle recovery, how strong it becomes, it will motivate the user to, to use it more uh, as they use more because it's uh, uh, rehabilitation is through the intensive practice, uh, which the intensive um, component is very important. So it will enable them to do more. And even with uh, another example is, uh, for example, the FES work together with the EEG, which is for uh, brain uh, signal measurement. There has to be a kind of parallel for technology. For example, when you have a stroke, it's, it sounds crazy, but uh, uh, it is true. If you think about uh, the activity you want to do through this imagination, actually it contributes uh, to the recovery of the neural system. Um, if you, if you let's think about scenario, which you, through decoding the EEG signal, we can work out what is the patient's intention, what activity they would like to do. Uh, then use FES to trigger the stimulation. Actually, they can, they can imagine it at the same time they can do the rehabilitation activity. Bringing those two technologies together, um, I think it uh, will bring more hope, uh, make the treatment more, more effective. Uh, uh, so I think it's uh, it, it's a trend uh, um, for the future development because uh, by bringing those te technology together, they can serve different needs, uh, and it's also provide the potential for the, for example, the remote uh, monitoring um, because uh, the healthcare professional or the coach could uh, think how people are getting on with their recovery or rehabilitation process. So. Yeah, that's uh... great. Well, I know you're in agreement on this one, uh, Dave, because I can see you nodding your head, but I know you've got years of experience working um, uh, on the design side of this. So for you, really, what technologies work alongside EMS to enhance rehabilitation and recovery applications in, in your experience? Um, yeah, yeah, I think we're particularly sort of excited um, uh, about the possibilities when you start combining um, the FES technology in particular, but um, uh, EMS in general, with um, synergistic uh, technologies. And I would very much put Phil's, um, the, the, the work that Chimera do um, in with that. So, you know, looking at the, uh, looking at the research that um, is behind the Chimera um, far infrared emitting um, ceramic loaded textiles. Um, uh, the, in, in our interpretation, the, the, the recovery that Phil spoke about in terms of um, training recovery for, for athletes is, is a, does blur into other areas of recovery. We know that there's clinical evidence that it, um, it supports um, healing as well, um, potentially. So, uh, and, and what Kai was just talking about then, which is um, when you combine, um, when you're able to bring in sort of visualization tools to help with um, a person's recovery. Um, so uh, feeling that the muscle is doing something and understanding visually um, how that works and, and being able to visualize a future situation where that limb is moving properly again perhaps with the help of technology and, and cgi and, and 
things like that. We're, we're particularly interested, and we've had some great discussions with um, with collaborators and potential collaborators in these areas where we combine things together. But I would say, you know, just to kind of run through a list, inertial measurement units, you know, accelerometer type things, uh, are, are easily integratable into garments now. And so it's possible to know how a limb is moving relative to another and, and to actually build a full picture of how a whole body is moving. And as I mentioned earlier, timing, um, kind of targeted interventions uh, using muscle stimulation brings a whole um, world of possibilities really in, in terms of um, the work that Kai is doing uh, in particular, but there, there are lots of other sort of similar and parallel activities that we know about where we see that space opening up. I mean, please jump in, Phil and Kai. Um, yeah. I think that's why it's particularly exciting at the moment is because of the fusion of, of this um, intervention technology with the um, sensing technologies that are available and being able to fuse the, the, um, the analysis that's coming in from all of these sensors into something meaningful that you can then act on with the muscle stimulation um, opens up really big possibilities. So what's yeah. new? What's new, for you, Phil, for you in your world in relation to what Dave's outlined? You know, what's the new yeah, direction I, for Chimera? Well, I, I'll 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 take it in two parts. So definitely, I agree with with Dave that we're we're coming to the point where um, just having a, a single tool, if you were, that's giving you one measurement or one data point back mm -hmm. on, um, is, is no longer cuts it. Um, you talk enough. to professional coaches. You, you talk to trainers. Um, it's not just about providing more data. It is from a, from a software algorithmic point of view, you wanna be able to measure all sorts of data points um, and apply all sorts of different uh, methodology for recovery or performance monitoring, and then double back on yourself and make sure that they're doing what you're expecting. But then the, the humans, the coaches, the trainers who are there, uh, you know, who have full schedules and are trying to basically decide how are they gonna deal with a 22 man squad or a 42 man squad, depending on your team, uh, you know, they just want the insight. They want to be able to say, right, okay, I'm, I've got some system telling me to do X, and this is the level of confidence it's, it's giving me. And, and we all know um, in the sort of computer science space, to be able to give that level of confidence, um, you're going to need more data. So in terms of the data fusion, absolutely agree. In terms of combining different methodologies into, a, let's say, a single service offering, a single packet, makes absolute business sense. Um, and that sort of segues me uh, right into what we're doing with Chimera, which is we are looking at uh, smart garment technologies that are actually combining a whole source, host of different sensors and different capabilities in there. Because again, you can buy individual systems uh, that don't talk to each other, but then you're losing a lot of insight and then you're relying on the coaches and physios to actually take all that data and actually act on it. And the reality is that doesn't really happen anymore. There's, there's too much going on. Um, so you need to be able to look at uh, a single service offering or a single solution that's giving you all of that insight. So Kai, um, Kai how does academia and research respond to this? Because the industrial people on the panel are saying it needs to be a much broader approach. Uh, universities tend to silo their research. So how can we respond to what the sector needs? We are working very hard to keep in the speed uh, with, the, with the requirement, I've got to say. Um, yeah, I totally agree with the field, Dave. Uh, it's, uh, it's become more, more connected, uh, a whole system uh, uh, which can serve the end user needs. Um, uh, for example, we, we used to focus only on, on the because with research, it's always good to start with somewhere to see works before you build the whole system uh, but we totally agree for example with with the pain relief uh, even stroke rehabilitation what we did is uh, yeah we we need to to build a system demonstrate it work uh, then we need to add the functions uh, one example is uh, we start with uh, this, this field they might know we did we started with uh uh, wearable tents, uh, um, which is to improve the usability and the um, if, um, effectiveness through the electronic part. Uh, 
Um, then we we think about uh, what really matters to the end user. For example, they want to know how much they can bend their knee, how much activity they have done. So we develop a, a, a young form electronic sensor, which is embedded a paradigm form of the electronic component in a, in a thin, long yarn. And we can move into the textile, which we provide a kind of invisible integration to this measurement. Um, because uh, we, we think, uh, um, yeah, end user, you need to make uh, as easy as possible or the complicated uh, technology uh, should go just behind uh, when you present to the end user. It, uh, need to be something well designed, a simple use. That's why we, we work with companies uh, um, yeah, like uh, Chimera, Strive Wearables, because we don't have that expertise, but we know there's needs. So we work uh, with debris or just together and, and so, also add so the technology in the recent parts. So Kai, do you think the e-textile network then could support the sector because it brings together lots of different academic research in this area in the UK as the collective. Do you think it's able to support what the industry sector needs? Uh, yes, I think the textile network is a very uh, timely um, kind of platform. Uh, because uh, we 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 are working in academia, we also have some link with industry. Because, we, as I mentioned, we, we got some um, uh, interest in the you know companies like startups, the art company uh, we formed. So so we we know that there will be we talk different language, we have different priority, and but I think in the end we all have the same goal is we want to develop something useful. So with the textile network, uh, it uh, brings uh, together all the technology developers, regardless they are from industry or um, academia or the end user sector. Uh, so with this, we are able to share the knowledge. We are not try not to repeat the same mistake. Uh, we are built on the great technology others already have. Uh, to have uh, not a shortcut, but a more straight uh, kind of towards to what we deliver. So in textile network, uh, we the main activity, for example, we send a newsletter including all those uh, um, new developments uh, in the area. We sign posts to find the opportunities, uh, collaboration required, uh, and also we have uh, annual conference, okay. national conference. So I think it's a great platform uh, to, uh, yeah, uh, Okay, well, to that's, work that together. should be good. That should be good news for for the audience. So um, you'll be able to connect with Kai on that. Uh, one then for you, Phil. Uh, not a lot of companies have managed. There's been a lot of research, but actually taking the research and putting it into action in terms of developing electronic fabric technologies from prototype in a lab to real life in production. Um, tell us how complicated that's been for Chimera and how long's the journey been. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting challenge, really, because I think again, coming from a from an electronic engineering background, I think that the while it's a challenging bit of technological work to actually implement it, um, it's th the one stumbling block that that we in this sort of market sector have had is really the application and trying to find that application, that winner application that's actually motivating investors, uh, motivating people to invest time and energy into actually developing a product. Because um, a lot of work has happened in, in industry over the over the last couple of decades. That's, that's no doubt. Um, but it's that step, taking it from lab to uh, manufacturing to marketing, which is arguably a really expensive bit of work. Usually there isn't that much public funding available for this kind of work. There is some, but not as much as, as for example, for rudimentary or, or, or early stage research. And so a lot of companies are a bit hesitant to go for it if they don't find the, that killer application. Um, and we've seen uh, companies uh, come and go actually in this field as well, simply because they couldn't find that application. Um, so for Chimera, our journey really started in earnest in 2016, where we, where we won our first Innovate UK application, um, looking at uh, in incorporating electronics into some sort of garment assembly. 
And since then, we've been able to leverage that with investment. We've been able to use uh, our current sportswear revenue to actually fund our R&D. So a lot of it has kind of been on our own back to, to really push it forward and really finding the application or let's say the killer application to do it. Personally, we feel that it's professional sports and it's medical, really. Mass market is, is interesting, but mass market is very tough. A lot of companies that, that aren't here anymore, they've, they've gone through the, the whole, okay, let's try to develop something that pleases everyone. But you try to please everyone, you don't please anyone. Um, and, and really, that's the challenge. So for us, the biggest thing has been being able to navigate that market and figuring out, okay, where do we actually want to invest our time and resources, which is challenging when you don't have you know several hundreds of millions in a bank account so so dave would you agree with phil in relation to the two areas where he sees the potential for the technology to apply itself um yes i i think I, i'm fairly kind of long in the tooth as well in this, <laughs> this area because um i co-founded uh, a company that um was venture capital backed uh and it was set up in 1998. And this was, as, as I mentioned before, we put a conductive textile um, product, which was essentially like a touch screen in, in fabric, but uh, um, long, long way back. And, and we, we sort of fought various battles to get the textile industry to, to produce things um, to consistent tolerances that were suitable for a consumer electronics product and then you know a hundred thousand uh, flexible keyboards that wrapped around a palm pga if you can remember what one of those is <laughs> um w were produced under license uh, for logitech uh, and we worked with levi's and nokia and microsoft and, and lots of other companies i think the the fundamental problem that the um that the kind of investment caused it was heavily invested through venture capital um was a drive to sell lots of consumer electronics products, even though that wasn't really the that's not really the right space for this technology. So, um, I absolutely, Phil and uh, we, we've had a lot of discussions with Phil in the past as well, and, and we we know that we share the same view uh, on this already. But um, if you're going to use textiles in a product, um, especially conductive textiles in specialist applications. Make sure you can't do it any other way as a very first step. You know, will a flex circuit do it, et cetera, et cetera. And it's these kinds of applications in medical and um, garment integrated um, applications where it has to be, for example, the subject that we're talking about now, um, then yes, it, it's absolutely a suitable technology for that. If it's just a flexible circuit that you need, um, Really try and think of some other <laughs> some other way to do it first. So our, our approach here is, you know, over the years you develop a lot of um, kind of tools and techniques that can be applied to um, uh, to integrate things uh, according to what's needed. So um, you know, sooner or later it ends up with a, a PCB at some point if you're going to if you're going to make a sort of reasonably complex circuit. And, and therefore, you've got hard lumps to sort of integrate alongside your, your flexible stuff. And there, there are various sort of tried and tested techniques for sort of managing that and making sure that it's um, robust and washable and, and things like that as well. But these are all, these are all um, hurdles that have been overcome through uh, much struggle in, in some ways <laughs> back in the day when it was all unknown. So in terms of struggle, this is this is a key one really for you, Kai, because both of the boys reckoned this was a question for you. In terms of regulatory uh, requirements, um, particularly when you're working with stimulating muscles, um, it's high risk. Um, do you see any changes coming in this area? There's a lot of ethics involved around what you're going to be able to do. Um, what's your view as a leading academic in this area? Um, I might want to disagree. Actually, I don't think it's uh, it's it's high risk uh, for muscle stimulation. Okay, good. Uh, because uh, um, as I said, uh, the muscle stimulation device has been there uh, for quite a long time. Um, people use it benefit from the treatment. Uh, there's a very rare case, uh, uh, see, kind of reported damage. Uh, 
Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a kind of very rigorous uh, uh, regulatory you yeah. need to uh, meet in order to put your uh, product uh, on the market. Uh, for example, they have, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it's 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 quite a lot of technical uh, work need to do to test based on, for example, um, start with the all this data collected in the lab to. Uh, for example, the, the how robust it is, uh, make sure it's uh, biocompatible or not, uh, how um, kind of bring any damage to the skin. The current level shouldn't be exceed a certain level. Um, and also, especially for home use, there's another set of uh, uh, complicated, uh, very rigorous tests you need to go through in order to, for home use. Um, so, Personally, I'm very confident by the by meeting those um, requirements, uh, which you, some people see it as a barrier, but actually I think it's a responsible way for the manufacturer, for the government to, to do it. Because by uh, by test according to those requirements, uh, um, to the end you pre place somebody on um, something on the market and that's a place. Uh, uh, yeah, you already prove it, it's safe. Uh, um, so I, I think um, the regulatory proof uh, is a rigorous process. As long as you fo follow those, uh, do this correctly, I think it uh, will eliminate any, any potential risk. Uh, so, um, so for you, Phil, commercially then, what does that mean? There's a lot of regulations and I know you work internationally. So in terms of what you have to do in the UK and Europe and what you have to do internationally, you know, how does this whole regu regulatory um, process affect a business like yours that's a small business? Yeah, I, I would say that in terms of your dedicated effort, <laughs> you, you end up quite quickly ramping up how much, how much time you put into the regulatory side of things. I mean, um, you know, developing a technology that works is, is only a, a small part of the whole battle, especially when you're trying to have global reach. You know, we've, we've got different regulations, UKU currently following uh, medical device regulations with the FDA out in the States and, you know, every country or region will have their own rules. Thankfully, however, uh, there is a, a, a consorted effort to have what are known as harmonized standards to make sure that uh, what's, what's valid in one country is usually valid in another. So that's one good thing. So you're not having to start from scratch every, every time you go, you go to try to get a device out on the market. Um, but it is, it is challenging for a small company with not that much uh, resource or, or, or backing or even experience with quality assurance and quality management uh, relates to medical devices. It, it can be quite a daunting task. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something we're going to right now actually as, as a sort of pain point, but uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, sort of had to take on the role as quality manager for the company as well as chief Techn technology officer, but hey, that's, that's how it goes. Um, but we're building a really, really good system. And, you know, the good thing is you're always going to have audits. You're always going to have people looking at you, making sure you're doing it right. And they're not there just to make you stumble. They're, they're there to make sure that whatever you're developing is safe. So at least, you know, you're not having necessarily to do it alone. Um, but you certainly need to have some, some, you know, money tucked aside to be able to dedicate towards it. So yeah, as a, from a business perspective, if you're going to develop or want to go into the medical industry, start getting your quality management uh, sort of ASAP, it, it will save you a lot of hassle and redevelopment work in the long run. I think I, I would also contribute, if I may. Um, yeah, yeah, little, far away. There are certain things that you can do by design, and this is where integrating into garments um, comes in. So um, just for safety reasons alone, you want to be integrating all the kind of cabling and wiring and not have external cables that could become detached and and cause problems. Um, there are various things um, that point towards making sure that everything is kind of cleanly um, integrated within um, sort of the garment and can't be tampered with. Um, I understand you also need to avoid uh, um, passing current across the body where it could potentially end up going through the heart. Um, and so uh, you know, just making a kit where you could place electrodes anywhere obviously isn't going to isn't going to work. Uh, there are there are precedents out there as well. There are FDA approved devices in this space already, um, and so 
uh, you know, as as Kai said, there's there's a pretty long track record of of devices that are out there and have been proven safe over time. So um, th there is there is a starting place for the development of even quite new technology, as long as the right design principles are, are followed. Okay. So panel, I'll just I will have to I'll, I'll have to move us on actually because we're going to run out of time on the end. We have a, a key question that I'm really interested in uh, the panel. We've got two members of the panel from academia, two from industry. I'll start with you, Dave. Uh, what's what's your view on getting great academic work into world changing products? How, how do we connect or how should we be connecting? Um, and how can we, as a sector, support what you're doing um, in this space? Um, we work quite frequently with, with academia on, on very specialist um, applications. So we tend to, um, we have a network and so we, we tend to kind of browse for um, particularly relevant expertise in in particular areas and then set up some kind of shared destiny um collaboration where we um where it's relatively easy to find things to find situations where we can both benefit with we both get out of the relationship do you find the same phil yeah i agree i think collaboration with with uh, research and academic institutions is the way to go i think that you know, th there was an idea back in the day where, you know, only the biggest companies, the most valuable companies did cutting edge R&D that changed the world and what have you. But realistically, in this day and age, uh, I think all universities need to, to get on board and become quite entrepreneurial with the way they, they deal with the research. Because sometimes I'll deal with universities and I mean, we deal with loads of different universities. Um, we'll deal with universities who are on it and they can see the potential and we can quickly get past any red tape and any, any really exciting cutting edge research can immediately look at getting transferred to industry for the benefit of both the university, the academics and the business. But there are others who kind of still seem to be stuck in, in the old days where, you know, it was research and academia for research and academia's sake and publishing papers and not really taking it forward, which some, some amazing cutting edge research is a real shame when essentially it just gets uh, lost to just papers and journals and doesn't actually exit. Uh, the academic space. So I would definitely encourage any research institution to really get on get on the on the boat and and work with smaller companies, not the biggest ones in the world. Work with smaller companies and and help to push out new products based on really exciting research. I, I would also just, if I may, just add um, the timing of when to of when to collaborate with companies like ourselves or or Chimera. Um, to take something forward is, is is really important. We we see a lot of really exciting in five years time technologies that might or might not um, come to fruition in that sort of time scale. But um, we're also interested in fairly um, in fairly near term uh, implementable technologies. So we've got a series of um, pretty organised steps that we go through it's quite a lean process where for fairly short amount uh, fairly small amounts of of, um, of money in terms of a project cost we can establish the feasibility in in quite rough and ready um, ways and then uh, it it brings in investment to the next stage and, and we can take it forward and then we we go through if if you look on our website we've got a series of kind of um established steps that we go through all the way from idea through to production and it doesn't need to be a kind of hugely costly process and we can also take it step by step to match in with um stakeholder investment into the project Okay, um, and with that, I would, um, we'll, this will just finish our session now in terms of the questions, and uh, the, then um, the panel will take questions from the floor. Uh, I'm now, then panel, I'm now going to go on and summarise what we've actually done so they can do a split. Okay, so in summary, um, the session today, uh, we've discussed current academic and uh, 
thinking and research related to muscle stimulation for rehabilitation and recovery. Um, on the panel, we have had uh, two representatives from the academic community from the University of Southampton and from Manchester Metropolitan University and uh, a design development business um, who are actually sponsoring the panel today and uh, an innovative sportswear business, uh, Chimera. Um, the team have considered what the opportunities are for health and what their businesses and their own uh, and their academic institutional institutions uh, personal approaches have been from the areas that they operate in. Um, and I just like to ask each of the panel uh, in terms of, you know, where they're operating, um, what what do they want out of the panel discussion today? And I'll start with you, Kai. Um, the outcome for you and your university in Southampton. What what do you want to say to the audience? Thank you very much. Um, as I said, we have worked on electronic textile for over 10 years. Our key expertise is on the um, functional materials, including print, electronic inks, uh, manufacture process, and we work on uh, a lot of uh, applications. And today is just a kind of a, a small fraction of the work uh, we are doing. So we collaborate with the industry um, quite often. So please do reach out uh, if you think uh, we can help. Uh, enjoy the e-textile network because that's a great place to find the resource uh, and uh, yeah, keep, keep uh, informed of what's new in the area. And, Thank and thanks, Kai, that's great. Uh, over to you, Phil, then. What do you want to say to anybody watching? Well, firstly, thanks very much for listening to us all. We'll, we'll speak to you for, for the last 40 minutes or so. Um, it's, you know, it's a really exciting time. Chimera are, are uh, relatively early days, but developing all sorts of different technologies. Uh, we love collaborating with other SMEs and universities and academic institutions. Um, not only do we do a lot of development ourselves, but we also uh, have roots to market with our current revenue generating sports there. So it's, it, it puts us in a quite interesting position. And yeah, just generally, you know, um, we're quite approachable a uh, bunch of people. So if you want to get in touch, if you have some ideas for collaboration or different synergies, just yeah, um, my details are on are on uh, the landing page, uh, giant, the, the giant conference and, and what have you. And yeah, in general, just enjoy the rest of your conference. It's, it's going to be an interesting one. And last but not least, Dave, over to you. Um, yeah, we're, we're just interested in connections in this space. Um, we've already been involved with a number of clients um, in this area. Um, we have internal, our own internal um, innovation work progressing as well. Um, our mission is about uh, ec creating exponential gains in health and well-being and that's, um, that's what we're looking for collaborations um, in that in that area, but we we see this area as particularly um, exciting uh, just now. It's it, it feels like a tipping point, and so we're just opening up the discussion really and see what happens. Brilliant, that's great, Dave. And um, as as far as um, myself and the team at Manchester Fashion Institute, we're garment engineers. Uh, we're we're experts in anthropometrics, size and fit, um, and we're really interested in the. Uh, development of wearable technology within clothing because that's our area of expertise. So on behalf of Thrive Wearables and the team at Giant, uh, everybody on the panel would um, welcome uh, feedback from anybody out there. If you think anybody on the panel are able to help any of your businesses and be a cost benefit for you. Thanks very much. Okay, so thanks for joining us today at the Thrive Wearables track at the Giant Health Show 2020. It's uh, fantastic to be back at the show. Uh, we've been doing a track here for two years before this one. And so it's, um, it's great to be back and a little different this year, obviously, with all the video conferencing and uh, a different set of technologies and um, approaches to, to running the show. So well done to the team at Giant for all they've done to get this working. Uh, and it's great to have everyone here today. We've got a really great uh, lineup today for this session, and we're going to be confronting the question, how will 
technology improved mental health and it's a really hot topic of course at the moment with covid and with isolation and different ways of working it's it's, it's something that's really uh, exciting in terms of the solutions that we may bring to that problem and i hope today's session will will cover some of the major themes we'll have time at the end of the session where you can ask questions of the panel and uh, there'll be plenty of time for that so uh, just engage with us through the session and beyond um, and those questions will hopefully get aired and uh, combined together and we'll, we'll continue the discussion in a live format but first of all we're going to uh, have a discussion with the panel and uh, cover some themes around the mental health uh, issue and uh, technology solutions therein. Just a bit about Thrive. So we are a design and development consultancy. We work predominantly in the health and wellness space. We are um, a mission driven business. We are here to have impact in that world and we seek to work with collaborators, partners, um, across academia, the health services in the UK especially, but globally, um, and then with commercial partners as well to, to uh, really kind of use sensors, data, networks, systems of connected products and services to solve health problems. Um, so it's great to be here at the uh, Giant Health Show again, as I said, um, and uh, yeah, please do contact us if you'd like to be in touch about uh, working with us or getting involved in some of the stuff we're doing, thrivewearables.com slash giant 2020 you will be able to find uh, links on our website and also profiles for all the speakers at this session and the others so uh, without further ado i'd love to introduce the panel uh, who are going to be speaking today um, i'm going to go around um, on my screen as i see it here and start with uh, deborah roseman from um, uh, heartmath would you like to introduce yourself deborah thank you so much jacob Yes, I'm the president and CEO of HeartMath Incorporated, and we are one of the probably original companies that in 1991 started to research heart, brain, nervous system response, and develop tools and technologies for people to basically learn self-regulation skills. We determined that the biggest issue in the world then, and certainly even more so now with all the increased stress is the lack of ability to emotionally self-manage or self-regulate. So we've been on a mission ever since we started as well to really help what we call activate the heart of humanity. And we do it through research assessments and training programs, content technology, a whole ecosystem we have HeartMath UK, a licensee in the UK, HeartMath Benelux, HeartMath Deutschland, so we're in Europe pretty strongly as well as the US. But we basically uh, have a mission that's even stronger now, which is how do we combine mental health issues and self-regulation skills that are scientifically validated with technology feedback with content and in an engaging way that is gonna motivate people young and old to want to actually take charge of themselves and do something and feel and see the benefits and be rewarded as they go. And so that's really our focus and strategy continues to be that. And there's so much more opportunity now with all of what you're doing and everybody who's on this panel and others who are sensing not only the opportunity, but the great need of humanity to find new ways to address stress. And it's not just addressing stress, it's lifting consciousness, it's giving bigger picture thinking, because it's only as we've discovered through our research through the heart, and the heart mind in alignment that we're going to come up with new solutions, bigger picture connections, get along with each other, all the things that we haven't been able to do as humanity and our passion, my passion is how do we make, how do we help technology facilitate that rather than separate us. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Wendy Moore, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm Wendy Moore. I'm the COO and Data Protection Officer of Helium. And I couldn't agree with Deborah Moore. Um, this is in the wake of COVID. Um, we know that chronic stress is a mental health emergency. So that's what we're working on at Helium as well. And so Helium is a drugless and fast acting stress relief powered by your body's electricity. So it's an evidence-based intervention that reduces anxiety in as little as four minutes, and it's uniquely powered by the user. So we're allowing the user to actually see their stress personified so they can learn to control it. 
think of it like mental fitness for a new reality. So we're powering these immersive media experiences, allowing the user to both see their stress, learn to control that, and then also bringing in that biometric data from wearables. So an EEG headband or a heart rate a monitor using a smartwatch or other wearables that allow you to, as you lower your heart rate, then you can make butterflies hatch in augmented reality. Or in virtual reality, you can make the furries fly inside of a magic snow globe. So we're teaching the user to self-regulate their brain patterns and create a stored memory that they can then recall again in a stressful situation. Um, so again, I echo what Deborah was talking about. I mean, just building that mental resiliency and tying this in with these beautiful immersive experiences that the user can then recall. Um, in Helium, we can learn to develop either focus or calm and just by shifting gears within the experience. Um, so we work on both virtual and augmented reality, trying to make these experiences accessible and available um, on many different platforms um, and work across uh, or hardware agnostic platform. Um, so we're using this biometrically driven immersive content platform to not just track all that data, but also interact with it. Um, and by personifying those stress levels, we're allowing the user to have control over the experience and then are reminded that their thoughts have power. So not only in these virtual worlds that they're learning to control, but in the real world as well. And as we all know, that could not be more needed. So. Fantastic, thanks Wendy. Yeah, I guess uh, we're all living in a bit of a virtual world at the moment, so where, where does the line get drawn? Um, Noga Sapir, please introduce yourself. Thanks, uh, my name is Noga Sapir. I have a background in textile design and in neuroscience, and I'm the founder and CEO of Reflect Innovation. We're developing Reflect, a soft and tactile biofeedback device that allows users to practice relaxation and reduce stress through a sensory experience that is pleasant and comforting. So Reflect is a soft orb that acts as a companion, like an extension of the user's body. And we aim to create a special bond between the device and the user that can bring comfort and calm anytime and anywhere you go. It's a biofeedback experience that is designed and tactile and is meant to um, really engage the user in the calming experience in itself. So it's not feeling very technological, or very medical, but it's something that anyone can engage with. Um, we are VC backed and we're just wrapping up a successful beta testing. We plan to launch the product next year and make it available for anyone who needs to carve out moments of calm in the day, which is obviously on everyone's mind. Fantastic. Yeah, sounds um, sounds familiar. The worlds of uh, hardware and uh, uh, and software and kind of trying to get those things to market. It's, uh, it's a long, long old journey. I think everyone can empathize with that one. Um, and Anna Goodmanson, last of all, but not least. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Anna Goodmanson. I'm co-founder and CEO of uh, Bioself Technology. And my background is all in, in technology, large, small companies. I've been CEO for small but listed company. I've raised money, pivoted, scaled, failed, um, all of that. And amongst that also worked previously with wearables in the corporate well-being space. So it's the second time or third time I combined sort of services and, um, and wearables. Um, and so uh, by us of technology, we develop technology that deals with stress and anxiety um, and the sort of... Um, um, illness to come with that, so inflammation, lowered immune system, etc. And our core product, the Sensate, um, uses near infrasonic resonance to tone the vagus nerve, and um, that amongst amongst other things, and uh, to provide relaxation in as little as ten minutes. So, um, you know, it's based on my co-founder Stefan Stranik's decades of work helping some of the most difficult cases of stress and trauma and associated disease and working with um, an infrasonic and near infrasonic therapies very um, successfully. And then we've been working and uh, Jacob's been on the journey with that, just throwing in a little plug for Thrive, uh, very talented people, um, to be able to bring this to a wider audience. Um, and so we are more focused on the therapeutic element than the tracking uh, to really sort of bring um, something to a larger audience um, to to um, help with um, um, stress and anxiety. Fantastic. 
Uh, Deborah, I'm going to start by asking you a question about uh, about heart and mental health because stress is a, another connector, I suppose, between everyone on the panel. How, how does how does heart health and heart signals and the heart connect with mental health? Just for our audience, so we we understand that. I think it's a great question, a very important one, because so often mental health research has been all about the brain, some of the nervous system. And what we and others in a field called neurocardiology, which just started in the 1990s, so it's fairly recent, have discovered is that the heart is much more than a blood pump or arteries and veins. There's an intrinsic nervous system in the heart that actually has neurons that are sensory that feel, learn, and remember, and sense. And part of that function is to receive input from the blood and from hormones and from all sorts of chemicals and nervous system from the body and then send it through the vagal nerve and other pathways to the brain. So the brain then knows how the body feels and will respond according to its habituation or its its uh, functions. And so the heart's input to the brain is critical, it's crucial in understanding stress and how the body is processing information. And so what we see is that if you can get the heart rhythm pattern, the heart rate variability or the beat to beat changes in heart rate, which reflect our emotional state, synchronize, and then that signal is sent to the brain, it opens up uh, frontal lobes, compassion, care, qualities of heart, brain that we really need as humanity and we really need to be able to shift depressive moods, anxiety, stress, so we're not looping around there. And the heart's input is critical to that. Um, and so, again, heart math is all about how do we get the two in sync and what do we do when we're out of sync and how to get back so that we really can have more uh, heart base living and higher quality thinking. Fantastic. So I, I guess um, I guess the heart's still inside. When we talk about kind of biofeedback and, and physical devices and the interaction that, that we can establish, and Anna and um, Noga, you, you, uh, you will both have this kind of experience with, uh, with physical technologies. I thought, um, Noga, that you're, you're your product represents this kind of really great interface. It's kind of the archetype of, of physical connection to uh, digital technology. Can you just explain how, how that works a bit, how, how you kind of connect with people on a physical, in a physical form and, and how that then feeds back and creates that loop? Sure. So Reflect acts as a biofeedback device. It measures parameters of stress through the user's fingers. So it is a knit fabric covered orb that is uh, a bit soft to the touch. And when the user places their fingers on reflect, a light lights up and the LED light changes colors relating to the user's emotional um, state. So then uh, you can create a biofeedback loop and try to guide yourself towards the light that um, symbolizes the calm. Uh, you can also, of course, do the other way around if you want to energize yourself. Um, but the thing about it is giving you an experience of control. So you get to see how you're feeling. You get to maybe become more aware of your body and of your senses. And you become more in control of it once you see um, where is it going. So you get to start seeing patterns of when am I most stressed? What things can I think of that make me more relaxed? What breathing patterns should I use? So we guide the user into understanding of themselves using biofeedback as a tool. Fantastic. And Anna, does that relate to, to Sensei a bit? How, tell us about how that works. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, Deborah was talking about the vagus nerve. And so we are not that focused on the, the feedback loop, at least not yet. We are really focused on the therapeutic element. And so, um, and this is coming from the fact that um, 
you know, Stefan has been working with thousands of patients and found that this really works. Um, so I think it's super helpful. I think there are a number of different aspects of this. So, so obviously there is an educational part and understanding ourselves, which in and of itself is really helpful. And, and that's also why apps, for example, you know, have fill a certain purpose because that help us understand ourselves. Then we've got hardware that make, gives another dimension, which is measuring and getting that feedback. I think there is um, a lot of interesting aspects about that. I mean, I, I've got the heart math thing <laughs> being here. Uh, we're we're a massive fan um, as, as a company of uh, measuring my sleep with the Aura Ring, which I also think is a, is a good device. Um, but we also have some evidence around um, certain tracking actually increasing anxiety. And um, it is really multidimensional. Um, and so... Uh, we have a lot of empathy about the fact that um, with mental health, the journey isn't linear. And so um, to kind of think that you're going to use this and you're going to feel a little bit better every time isn't a helpful um, sort of um, what's that, expectation. And having worked um, in technology, habit creation and all of that for uh, decades myself in, in other areas, we have to approach mental health and mental well-being in a different way. Because it is, you know, if you do sit-ups um, every morning, you're going to have a more or less linear um, um, improvement, whereas that is just not the case when it when it comes to uh comes to mental health so um uh, in this mix um we're focusing very much on where we find that we can add the most value and really help give the most uh relaxation and uh you know uh, deborah mentioned the vagus nerve and i think uh, you know what stefan has come to in his his research and work is that a good vagal nerve tone is the absolute number one thing that um aspect of recovery um and mental well-being so however we approach that i think um you know it's it's in central to, uh, to the mental um health industry Thanks, Anna. And um, Wendy, I, I, you, you've dodged a bullet a bit, haven't you, with uh, with having an agnostic kind of offering? You, you don't have to build your own hardware, and, and everyone else is going to be uh, a bit envious of that position. Does this free you up to kind of focus in on that data and be able to, you know, really kind of find quite diverse ways of, of using that? How, how do you how do you use data within Helium? Yeah, that's a great point. And really, it's because we want to work with all of these fabulous devices and meet users where they are. So we're leveraging wearables people are already using or um, devices that are already being used um, in the organizations that we're working with. Um, so being hardware agnostic has been um, fab fabulous for us on that. Um, when we work with data, uh, we're really just focused on when we do receive all of that information, how we personify that data that is coming from the wearables. And it's important our users actually understand that sheer amount of important information, but then also aren't overloaded by it. Um, so when we personify the data, I mean, we could give you stress as a flat number, or we could show you that as a Jaguar that starts out kind of agitated. And then as you calm your stress response, the Jaguar calms and softens and starts to lick its paw. So we find that you know, we know the brain believes what it sees. So with Helium, we're creating those memories that help the user associate both that calming action with this visual, with the sense of control, and with that sense of I can return back to here in that stored memory that I've now created. Um, so we focus a lot on existing um, neurofeedback research, existing data that's out there in the world and then try to give that data summarized in a way that gives the user some real insight into how that's reacting and how they can improve through regular training, regular usage. Um, and I mean, there's a big difference between flat media, um, audio only and this immersive media. I mean, that's well documented. And so being spatial um, makes it more memorable, makes it more engaging for the user. Mm, fantastic. I'm it's um yeah I, I love the idea of just that that kind of extra set of dimensions within within VR and and I think yeah you know kind of it's it's what's sort of clear from what people are saying is the idea of mental health is really complex obviously really non-linear and quite hard to pin down in lots of cases although there are some kind of clear causal effects in terms of you know heart rate variability is something that's flagged a lot 
Um, kind of how do we quantify that? What, what's the way that we pin down this idea of mental health and mental health improvement? And, you know, how do we just, you know, in terms of sports and those kind of things, people want to know that they're getting better. You know, are we getting better? Is our mental health getting better? Or are we just sort of drifting around in a sea of kind of ups and downs? How do we quantify it? Deborah, let's start with you. Yes. Well, that's been our focus for the last 25 years is how do you quantify it and feed it back so that people can see and feel that what they're seeing and feeling are resonant. So again, heart rate variability, there's both the amount of heart rate variability that you need a lot of for uh, health and wellness. And if it's too low for your age, that's a predictor of all cause mortality. So you want to increase that. And most HRV devices and technology now are related to recovery and fitness and increasing the amount, which is how much variability there is, how flexible you are physically and also emotionally. HeartMath is focused more on the pattern of heart rate variability and over time, because heart rate changes with every single beat. And if you can plot that, what we see is it directly affects, it reflects emotional state. So when people can get more synchronization or coherence in their HRV pattern, their heart rhythm pattern, actually within a short period of time, six to nine weeks, we've done thousands and thousands of assessments, they begin to have a baseline shift. So in terms of your question, how do you know you're improving? Well, it's gotta be subjective, you gotta feel better. But you also objectively want to see a baseline shift in some metric. And so we call this heart rhythm coherence because it's a sine wave, a coherent waveform. And the way it entrains the brain waves into synchronization or coherence and the nervous system. And like we talk about the vagal tone, Anna was mentioning, all of that improves. And when you get your coherence baseline increased, and that can happen using technology feedback like our inner balance, like Anna showed you, our technology or our M-Wave, and you see the metrics and you see that your scores are going up in terms of your coherence. And it's reflected in your resting state, HRV assessment baseline. Then you know, because it's actually confirming what you feel inside. Obviously, if you have a baseline shift, the technology says, oh, you're better and you don't feel it. That's a disconnect. It's, a, it's a immaterial. How you experience is number one. And if you can get technology refined, so it's reflecting, which we're all trying to do, the user's experience, and there's that positive feedback loop, and then you can measure some metric. And again, you can use brain waves, but we don't feel brain waves. We sure feel heart rhythms. And you can feel that shift and emotional aha as you get more coherent. That's incredibly motivating, but it's also reflecting the communication in your heart, brain, nervous system that is now synchronizing and improving and coming into your resonant state, which is allows more whatever you want to call your spirit, your true self, your sense of security to come through. And that's really what people are yearning for. Mental health is nonlinear, but the linear is the baseline shift. And if we can all help people see and have content. It's not just the tracking. It's the training and the therapy and the content that facilitates self-empowerment, self-regulation, so that you can go, wow, I did that. I achieved this baseline shift. And we can build in all sorts of rewards through AR, VR, gamification. The, the world is of creativity that can happen with technology is enormous. Once we know what we're trying to achieve, and to me, the achievement truly is facilitating people to create that self-empowerment and baseline shift, whether you're measuring coherence or brain waves, coherence in the heart rhythm is actually the easiest metric. People can feel appreciation and immediately see their coherent rhythm. That's like, wow. So having these aha insights and making it simple enough that anyone can do it and making it fun is really what our next level is and providing content to all you guys. We've been 20, 30 years creating really refined content 
for people to achieve this. And we're not interested in necessarily being the only hardware or by any means the only anything, but being able to provide this content of uh, baseline shift, heart coherence is what we feel is going to help humanity. And that's, that's the metric. If you can have a baseline shift, your mental health, your emotional health, your physical health, it's all improved. Fantastic. And does anyone else want to add to that? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I just wanted to add to that. And I, I, I agree to all of it. Uh, and I also like something that I think is an important met metric is the practice. And, um, you know, there, um, you know, if you look at the vast majority of people in the rat race, uh, if you you might see that linear baseline shift if you are doing a daily practice, but it's extremely few that are doing a daily practice. And I've been working with habit creation in technology space for many years, and it's always going to be more or less a single digit uh, percentage that will create a daily practice of anything new meditation, what, what have you. And we know that those things work, but it's hard to, to, to get the vast majority of people to do a daily practice. So you will have times where your, um, your metrics and your practice are better. But I think what's important with the quantification is that it doesn't demotivate you that maybe there's a decrease because you've fallen off the, um, the, the, <laughs> the practice or the bandwagon, so to say. Um, and that um, even when you might just had a baby and it isn't about the, the performance, but if you do it once a week, every time you do it, that is a metric of progress. So I think we want to also really encourage just measuring and quantifying the self-care action of actually doing something versus necessarily the focusing only, at least not only, on the measurable um, sort of metrics, um, such as, you know, heart rate variability is a great metric, but, but that in combination with actually just doing the practice. That's really interesting. And, and Noga, do you have um, kind of, uh, did you find it easy to get people to use your, your product and to engage with it long term? And how do, you, how do you kind of make that happen? How do you reduce those frictions? Definitely. So I definitely agree with Anna that we are um, treading dangerously here when we try to tell people how they feel. And we want to be very encouraging of their emotions, all of them. And we don't, we want to be very wary of telling people right now you're not feeling well or you're feeling bad or abnormal. So I found that people most engaged with the product when they didn't try as hard to succeed in it, when it wasn't like an assignment that they had, a task that they had to complete. Just showing up, just practicing really gave them um, this sense of accomplishment, this sense of awareness. And we were talking about hardware versus software. So one of the things that are really good about Reflect being a hardware device is that its physical presence in your space uh, reminds people to think of themselves, even if they're not holding the device right now or using it right now, they would see it in, in the corner of the living room and they would take a moment to check back with themselves, to check back with how they're feeling. And this is already great. I've already done my job, um, I think, uh, in making people think of well-being. So definitely just um, giving people a very encouraging experience through the device, through the accompanying app, um, and just telling them that we want to help them become more aware and more uh, in, connect in connectedness with their body is already helpful in establishing a habit. And we want to make Reflect really um, pleasant and really nice to touch and also very beautiful so you can have it, you want to present it in your space. And those things we found really supported the habit formation. And we did some long-term studies um, and we found that people kept using it in, in very encouraging numbers. And we think that we give this really nice experience that you want to come back to um, when you need it. So you don't have to necessarily do a daily practice or try to reach a goal, um, but you can 
carve out some time for yourself um, at the end of the day or once in a while when you need, feel the need and that reflect is there for you is already really helpful. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. There's, um, there's a product called Whoop. And for, for the audience out there who, who don't know what that is, it's a basically a, a heart measuring band that you can wear on a wrist or at the top of your arm. But the model around that um, product is really fascinating because they basically say to you, just wear this all the time. Hard luck. Pay us loads of money to wear this all the time. That's as far as I see it, their model. And it seems to work very well for people who are dear to it and really want to get those results from it. And it's more tailored towards uh, sports and recovery and performance and, and these kind of things. But there's an interesting model there, isn't there, of, of, of a, a way of monetizing these kind of technologies, which are kind of float within the gray area of cause and effect and um, sometimes can be hard to sell because they're not instant. I mean, they're considerably um, positive in terms of what they can do in many cases, but it's not obvious when you buy it and put it on that it's done that. So I don't know, maybe Wendy, you could sort of jump in on the the monetization, the business models around these mental health and um, physical technology uh, product propositions. What's your experience with, with selling this new sort of paradigm of product? Yeah, and it certainly is interesting because there's many like that that are gathering data all the time. Um, And really our focus at Helium is always just, not just that that data collection, not just that data um, tracking, but again, interacting with it, bringing it to life um, beyond the monthly subscription model, beyond, um, you know, potentially monetizing that data. And what else can we do with that to bring that into a more personalized experience for the user. There's certainly an approach in the future to be able to serve up and use this as a recommendation engine. So we're all tracking this data on a regular basis. Um, Maybe something is recommended to you on, according to your stress response, um, how you are at this point, or are you really there? Um, But how can we do that in a mindful way that it's, you know, marrying uh, the mindfulness of being aware that technology is a part of our everyday life and using that. um, I I loved uh, all the women who spoke before talking about um, the reminders and everyday experience that we need to maybe we don't put on the technology every single time we need to experience this. Maybe we just see that as a reminder and we have the recall ability to come back to that. Um, we do a lot, of, even without a wearable, you know, it's just our users wanting to escape into a mindfulness experience without the wearable data for a break from all of that coming at you, all of that information being collected. Um, so there's there's certainly a model to do so um, in the future. And there's also a model to serve this up as a recommendation engine, even if I'm not coming to the application itself, but we do have to remember to do that mindfully and we're not just adding to the noise. Yeah, it's really interesting. We, we, I mean, we do a ton of work in the sort of world of service design and, and user experience design and those kind of, those things are so delicate these days. People are so sensitive to, to good design and good um, interfaces and f- reduced friction across everything from Apple devices, you know, through to, uh, you know, just wanting everything immediately and on a stick as it were have you any of you got sort of experiences of of epiphanies when it comes to those sort of things how do you kind of reduce those frictions how do you get these technologies to be simple to use and to to work for people in their in their world yeah well i've worked i guess in that field for a big portion um of my career and i think there's you know when i started i actually you know, was looking into um, usability design and all of that in the late 90s. Um, So a whole industry has evolved um, around it. So what I think we should reflect of is sort of the the evolution of and the KPIs that have driven the tech industry um, and kind of flag a little bit what they've done to, to the tech industry. So if we have 
if we look at, for example, at um, what we've optimized social media for, we've optimized social media with machine learning for keeping people on the platform as long as possible and maximize um, ad revenue. And so what is what that has done is that that has um, prioritized <laughs> conspiracy over truth because that actually does optimize for keeping people on the platform. So we have to be really conscious with these kind of things. And, you know, I've been through the school of how to make apps and experiences addictive, um, which is obviously big in the gaming industry and so on. So, um, you know, me being <laughs> native tech um, industry person, I think we need to scrutinize our processes, our KPIs and, and, and values. I think that culture and process becomes really, really um, important so that we, I think there are some of these techniques that we um, can use um, for, because like it's, it's good if you sort of get addicted to meditating, for example, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we need to really look at what, um, what, we're, uh, what we're optimizing for. And then just in terms of, of business model, I think that, um, you know, I come from much more of a software service as, um, app uh, space, and that's kind of uh, what I've done mostly, but have then also worked with, with hardware. And I think there's something really healthy about the combination of hardware and software business models um, that is not um, as appreciated uh, necessarily by investors as I, I think it should be. I mean, I look at the industries, both of fitness apps and, um, and well-being apps without hardware and 90 plus percent um, uh, never become profitable and never have a lifetime value over cost per acquisition that is that is um over one so so i think uh, you know the the business model for all of our companies um are actually really relevant and, and really healthy and how we develop um Hardware, it's just your <laughs> expertise, <laughs> Jacob, has also completely transformed over the last two, three decades. Yeah, and I think um, even in the last two or three years, in fact, hardware has transformed a lot in the world of wearables because of the, the things that are available now. And it's, uh, it's, it's a much easier place to make technology for, for wearable uh, applications than it was when we started five or six years ago. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to segue from that into the idea of community and how these products and services relate not just to the user but to those other users around them locally far away. Um, I'm going to ask Deborah maybe to talk about the HeartMath Institute, which I, I wasn't aware of, I have to say, and I've I've had a look at, look at some of that stuff. So I'd love you to kind of start with that. But I'm sure you've all got stories around how you engage with community broader than the individual, Deborah. Yes, um, it's very exciting. It's where we're focusing a lot now. Um, if you look at personal coherence, which is the alignment of heart, brain, nervous system, synchronization to optimize our higher potentials, self-regulation, all that basic skill set, we have a lot of content that goes with our hardware to Anna's point. I mean, where we're all headed, I believe, for effectiveness, whether it's a subscription service, which is or whatever business model, hardware combined with content and a pathway and software and community. There's a third element there because people need accountability. They need support to be able to continuously improve habits, change. It's not done in isolation as Nova was saying. It's people feel bad if they fall off the wagon of any sort of self practice. And if in community, you support each other. The beautiful thing about communities per market, per what people identify with, like we're in multiple markets as HeartMath, from first responders to nurses to teachers to children to, you know, um, you know business leaders. And they all want to talk to each other and know what the best practice for them and their little, uh, their identity, their their group is. And being able to facilitate those kinds of sub-communities where it's meaningful for people. The other thing that's exciting is that we've been able to measure at HeartMath Institute social coherence. So as you are in heart rhythm coherence, your heart is creating an electromagnetic field with every beat, 2.5 watts of power. 
and it's broadcasting it like radio waves. That's how we pick up on each other's vibes, so to speak. So when we're stressed or frustrated, we feel it from each other. And it can certainly be measured in the heart rhythm pattern in the brain waves of people standing next to each other. And it's like, wow, we're affecting each other that much. And when we're in heart rhythm coherence, we're helping to uplift each other, not only emotionally, but also creatively, cognitively. So there's huge implications for how we facilitate community building. Are we going to facilitate all the negativity and the hatred that has been built on social media? Are we going to facilitate coherence and co-creativity in a positive way? And technology, hardware, software, and content all have a part to play in that. It's mm -hmm. our intelligence that can create and weave those input systems together to facilitate personal and social growth and consciousness. So our focus is how do we do this most efficiently? Social coherence games, you know, being able to license our algorithm to game companies to make it fun and addictive to come back and play a game that's going to facilitate your positive hormones, immune system. It's going to facilitate community with others to co-create something, and you're going to get rewards based upon being more coherent, because we know socially that coherence is contagious. When one person is coherent, actually, in research, other people who don't even know what they're being measured become more coherent. Now, that's incredible for society. If we can get a more coherent society by having our hearts resonate more, and that opens up new aspects of our brain potential, our human capacities. That's, I wake up every day passionate about that. Then we talk about global coherence at the Research Institute. We have a whole global coherence app where, with sensors throughout, in the, you know, throughout the world that's actually measuring human interaction with the Earth's fields and the rhythms of the Earth. And how do we have our inner environment coupled with the external environment to really accelerate um, this consciousness shift that's happening. So I think we all have a huge playground and it's all about co-creation. We each have our own businesses, but if we can do something together with our creative backgrounds and years of seasoning and intelligence, we can do so much more for this planet and for our own fulfillment. And that's exciting to me. That's what social coherence is about. Fascinating. I, I, I was just taken by what you said at the beginning about the heart having 2.5 watts of power. Well, I can, I can attest to that because I've in, in a lab condition, I've measured the heart at about two meters away right. with a sensor. So I, I've seen those signals and just, just kind of, yeah, I can just see how that network and it wasn't something I was thinking about at the time, but yeah, amazing, really fascinating. If you think about that signal, the heart, the heart's field, electromagnetic field, broadcasting like a radio or a cell phone, you know, the content of your emotional state, which it is through the pattern of your heart rate variability is broadcast through that field, affecting every cell of your body, because that pulse goes to every cell, just like Chinese doc medicine will read the pulse and know what's wrong. If you are putting out love, care, compassion, kindness, appreciation, the qualities of the heart or spirit that create heart rhythm coherence, that's being broadcast through your field to others, to your family, to your baby, to the energetic field of the planet. That's just not some woo-woo concept. That's actually measurable. And as we see we can do this and science validates it, and which it has in peer-reviewed studies, the hope for humanity, the hope for us to know that our heart really counts is incredible. So people are waking up to the we must heart. Have, um, we must have evolved over many, many years to have such yeah. sensitivity to that. It's fascinating. Uh, does anyone else have any kind of stories of community and how, how you're linking what you do with, yeah, with, a, with a bigger picture, I suppose? Well, yeah, definitely. Sorry. <laughs> Wendy. Um, we're, we're just at the start of our journey with consumers, but community is definitely going to be a big part of that. And I can say that when I envisioned Reflect, I thought of it as an experience that you do by yourself. That is, it is something that you do alone. Um, 
to connect with yourself. And this is not what I saw in the field when I presented it to others. I saw something that actually people communicated over and it created very interesting interactions between people. So we are definitely going to, to think about how we implement community and, and reflect as a more social experience with other people, whether it's like with friends or with uh, a wider community, because that's definitely uh, a power that can keep you on track, um, like Deborah mentioned, and is very, very um, inherent to the importance of, of creating a feeling of well-being, that feeling that you're not alone. Fantastic. Wendy? Yeah, and just to build on that, I mean, we, we love the power of community and we're always working on creative ways to bring our community together. Um, doing group sessions, because um, as you mentioned, I mean, we did start as this is something that's private and individualized to you, but you can also, you know, share augmented reality through a Zoom call. And we've really, in this year um, in particular, gotten even more creative about how we reach people um, because social isolation and combined stress is at an all-time high um, on a global scale. And so how do we bring people together globally on a shared purpose, a shared mentality, and um, help them learn to build their uh, mental resiliency together, have these positive, beautiful experiences together um, in a way that uh, we've never done before. So um, the power of community is, is so critical. And um, as, as these ladies have said, I mean, you can feel that resonate when you do perform this as a group or when you do share this experience um, even across oceans, so. Yeah, that's really, yeah, I think it's, I mean, the, the community side of things is such an important thing at this time in uh, in the world where people are so physically disconnected. So it's um, it's great to see, yeah, people trying to build those experiences and, and connect people together. In terms of, in terms of kind of where we're going with, um, with mental health products, mainly based on the new technologies that are able to measure and to create that data. What, what, what excites you at this stage? Are the things that you see on the horizon in your work or um, around the community that you have that, that, that you think are going to be quite important coming, coming up in the next few years? We see lots of stuff going on from a technology point of view, but I'm sort of like thinking, how, how are these things going to play out? Where are we going with, with mental health products and services? So I think we're at a great time because um, obviously, um, well, not so great, but stress is an, an all time high, but um, more positively, mental health is now a topic that's on the table. So it's less stigmatized and it's less taboo to talk about it, whether it's because uh, younger generations are more open or whether because social networks give us that spaces that we can share. So we're just at a time where people are really aware of the stress and obviously they, they are also aware that it harms their health and they want to improve it. So this is a really exciting time to be in wellness tech and in mental health tech because people are really looking for these solutions. And especially with COVID and with what's going on right now and the upheaval of our everyday life, People are really searching for these solutions and searching to, to get tools, to start new habits, to pick up new tools that can help them gain control and also put their well-being at the forefront. Yeah. I, uh, are you breaking up a bit? Um, yeah. that you, um, can you start to get Anna? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I um, just wanted to uh, build on what Naga said, which is um, I'm very excited about the maturing on the in, of the industry and also that it becomes more than one industry. So we have a, a health industry that includes everything or a wellness industry or a fitness industry. There's they obviously a huge amount of, of sub um, um, subsectors and um, I'm excited about that to to see companies becoming very expert on whether that's addiction or postnatal or crime related or nutrition so uh, you know horses for courses and I think that there's a huge amount of opportunity and that's very exciting um, I think it's exciting to see an increase in in funding going into uh, to mental health tech I think that's really um, 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 
nice to see and there definitely is an increase. Um, and then also, I mean, personally, obviously with the sense um, I'm personally very excited about the horizon of the vibrational nature of us, of our organs, of because the universe is made of vibrations. So both from a physics perspective to uh, a biological perspective to really explore the vibrational nature. I think that's uh, something that excites me enormously. Um, and then also the, the sort of merging of industries. So industries that previously have been separate. So neuroscience with biotech, with psychology, with AI. And so all of those coming together, I think is, um, is unique. And it's, it's a new point in time and an inflection point. Um, so together with funding and um, all of that. So I think it's, it's an amazing time um, uh, for the industry. I couldn't agree more. Just to build on that, we are so excited about the concept um, of, and the awareness that mental health hygiene is just as important as physical health hygiene. And that conversation is being had and is at an all-time high on the effect that your mental health has on your physical health. And we are just really excited about a day when we can have these drugless interventions, digiceuticals, available on a, on a mass scale and awareness. Um, so you could, you know, walk into your local pharmacy and next to um, these physical health hygiene products or next to these, um, you know, antacids or stress, um, you know, take something for your headache. You can also take something for that stress response that's a technical intervention. It's a digital Um So we are so excited about the um, awareness level of that and just that tie between mind body um, where the conversation is being had. What I'm most excited about is people waking up to the energetic heart. Um, I mean, really, the heart is, um, from my experience and perception, is the next level of human evolution. And it's just the mind has taken us to where we see in society, but without the heart, we're not going to go the next level. And that it's being uncovered. People are intuitively feeling the nudge to connect more with the heart. You hear it in every country that we're in. It's not cultural. It's not religious. There's something in the air. And I'm really excited about how that's going to bring, we call it heart intelligence, more intuitive intelligence that's going to prompt what we all do. When you see it reflected in now insurance companies are going, wow, we need to fund, we need to cover mental health. Mm -hmm. We need to cover biofeedback. The VA administration has just adopted heart math for biofeedback, and that's fantastic, and they've got funding for it. And because they're recognizing that heart regulation, what we've been talking about, self-regulation is increasingly important for resilience, for vagal tone, for health, for recovery from trauma, addiction. I mean, it goes on because it's getting to the the source of human healing. What is the source? And this is what we're all talking about. We're all trying to hone in on how to help people increase their capacity and their potential or heal. And the heart plays such an important role in that, in the intelligence of heart and consciousness. And that's what I'm most excited about is listening to and following the heart and more people doing that. It's going to connect us with something bigger in the higher dimensional field. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a brilliant place to conclude. Um, we're back at the start talking about the heart. Yeah. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone for your contributions today. Really great to be talking to such inspirational women, leading companies in all sorts of dimensions, um, but all around the, the mental health discussion. And, and it's been a really great discussion. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, if you would like to get in touch with any of the panelists today, you can go to thrivewearables.com slash giant2020, or you can look at the Giant Health website uh, to connect. We are going to now move on to questions. And so there'll be about 15 minutes for questions uh, from the panel. So thank you all for listening. Um, and we're looking forward to those questions now. Thanks again to the panel for that really fantastic talk. Really exciting to have you all back today to answer live questions. And uh, we haven't got anything in the box at the moment. So anyone who's out there listening and would like to pose a question, 
So they sell a line out uh, on speaking this evening in the UK and this morning over in the States for some of you. Uh, please do, do stick those questions in the box. I, I have a couple of questions to, to get us started, though, whilst we're, we're waiting. Um, over and beyond all the really great topics we covered. Um, one thing that came up as we we went through that discussion was the idea of stress as a kind of emergency. We're, we're in a state of emergency with our, um, with our mental health. Uh, sorry, just switching off something else there. Um, and, and I kind of compared that a little bit in my head to climate change and the fact that that's an emergency. And these two things really suffer from a similar problem, one of sort of present bias where people are kind of not looking at the long term, they're quite fixated on the short term. And so I, I suppose combining that idea of present bias and the, and the, the sort of reluctance to, to worry about the longer term, how do we kind of manage, how do we manage that change that we have to make if we're suffering from mental illness? And how do we manage the changes and the craziness that's all around us right now? It's a, a really, really transitional time in the world across so many dimensions. Uh, and mental health could be well placed right at the middle of that. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that sort of big topic area? Um, wh whoever wants to start on that, please please jump in. Well, I'd like to make a distinction between what we have control over at this moment and what we don't. Because mental health and stress, we do have more control over that than we have perhaps been taught or think. Climate change, we, um, we can do our little part, but that's the external thing. Stress is really, you know, we have to look at what it is. It's our perception and our response to our perceptions. And if our response to our perceptions is fear or anger or anxiety, it's going to throw our whole system out of balance and it's going to then lead to mental, emotional, physical health problems. And when we understand our inner psychology, our inner operating system, we can take more charge of it. And I think that's really what mental health and technology, the opportunity is there is to help people with biofeedback and other means to be able to take more charge of how they feel. We're not just a victim of random perceptions. And I think that's really where we can make a difference. And that in itself can begin to help people um, feel less victimized and more empowered to see new and solutions to external issues like climate change. So I think it still comes back to the individual taking energetic responsibility for themselves and learning how to do that. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's a bit of feedback. Dara, can you please mute your screen, I think? Oh, Jacob. Um, so it's definitely about our perception. And I think um, regarding stress and not so much about climate change, which is um, an objective uh, state, our perception towards our stress um, is what causes us the most harm. And there's been research on that, but the stress response itself um, is not as harmful. Like the body being in the state of alert, being ready to, to pounce and, and energize itself is not necessarily bad for you, but how you perceive it and how um, worried you are about it, how you're not channeling it into being productive or being more focused on, on what you're doing, this is what causes you the most harm and can also lead to health issues. So I think um, an educational point can be made about us dealing with stress and looking at stress as something that can even assist us in our lives or just knowing that we can use it uh, and channel it for good or we can be more in charge of it and the owners of our stress responses. I would completely agree. And um, some great points were made earlier in the session about how this is a process, learning to control your stress response, learning to control anxiety. Um, it's a process. So it's going to ebb and flow. Um, and really we're in the middle of the what we call the stress Olympics and not everybody has trained for that. And so what we can do as companies is provide tools that let you build that mental resilience, so you build that awareness and have tools to train over time to be able to respond to this stressful situation and whatever comes in the future. So that level of awareness, that level of control or being able to provide a sense of control and awareness over um, what is truly just 
the word unprecedented has been a little overused this year, but unprecedented stressful times um, that aren't going anywhere. Um, so I, I do think that each one of the companies here provides an amazing tool um, for insight and for that mental resiliency and training um, that users can take and move on through this time of um, just uncertainty. Yeah, I can have um, agree with all of that. It's not uh, an enormous amount um, to add. But, like with Central we're really focusing on that first step, and it's important that we have companies at all levels. So we are focusing on the people that are really struggling to take the first self-caring step, find it difficult to uh, establish a meditation practice, um, etc. And where we are today, um, that is actually the majority. So. The, there's a huge part of the population and um, you know, just iterating the points that it's, it's a crisis and it was a crisis before the pandemic. So we had already skyrocketing uh, numbers of anxiety and stress and then you know, the pandemic hit. So it's, um, it is um, you know, definitely a mental health crisis that we're looking at and also what's um, worrying is the younger generation um, that was anxiety, so 70% around, around um, Gen Z is around 40 for baby boomers. So we really need to address that. Uh, but, you know, before we are at a stage where people are able to take responsibility for how they are contributing to society, there is, you know, just the just basics of self care and being able to get out of a, a fight, fight, freeze um, um, stress response, which we've all been talking about. Um, Deborah, I think you're um, maybe you need to mute if you wouldn't mind, just because we have some feedback issues. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question uh, is inspired by discussing a moment ago with the panel some ideas around uh, their businesses, I suppose. And uh, we talked about responsible industry. I thought it was a great term and it really resonates with with us here at Thrive who, who are uh, restructuring our business around impact and looking to have that built into what we do. Anna, uh, tell me about responsible industry from the perspective of how you see that and what it means and, and what you're going to do with that. Yeah, I think I spoke a little bit about it just now on the panel, um, sort of especially with the technology industry. Um, and I guess my point is that good intention is not enough. I think a lot of people have gone into being helpful in NGOs and technology for a lot of different things with good intentions. But ultimately, if you don't really know um, your field enough or the impact that it's going to have, you need to at least have very thorough processes together and, um, and also culture that um, keeps asking questions, that is able to challenge the leadership and, and so on. So we, uh, and you know, together with Stefan, but I am certainly a very, very um, conscious about the culture we bring um, and how, how we keep questioning what value we, and how we are delivering value. So that is not just directly um, the technology that we're bringing to the market in form of the Sensate, uh, but also the wider, how we're doing it. It's not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And I think that um, when more than in almost any other area, um, when when you're dealing with, uh, with um, mentally and vulnerable, mentally and and well and vulnerable people, it's extremely important that um, the culture and the processes really drive scrutiny and continuously questioning um, what impact you're having. Uh, I can add to that and say that um, we are dealing with very sensitive issues and sensitive um, data. So first of all, we need to be responsible about how we store that data and the privacy of our users. And another thing that we need to be responsible for is we are not, we, we shouldn't strive to create dependency or addiction to the solutions that we bring. So obviously we want to bring calm, we want to bring some comfort to our users, but it's very important to me and I'm sure to everyone here that people choose to use our products when they feel the need and that it brings them that sense of comfort and then it brings them that solution but I for one I'm looking at reflect as sort of training wheels so biofeedback in general we want to give the user the agency to control their body to control their emotions and maybe later on they might not need the product 
So I would wish to create that experience where the user users reflect when they need to, when they want to, and at their own pace, and not because I'm trying to drive engagement because I want to sell more products or I want to show good numbers. So I think that's a very important thing to do. We want to give people the tools that they can feel that they are in control of themselves, of the stress, and of their relationship with the technology. Yeah, I would echo that. We take a lot of conscious, not only privacy by design, but the notifications, um, reducing the amount of push notifications, reducing the amount of noise that's added to um, just all of the other media that's coming at our users. Um, so we encourage our users to turn off media um, when they can to could really focus on that digital diet and how that digital diet can make you sick with overexposure. Or you can add things to it that are um, positive and uplifting and are going to add um, you know, fiber as you will to your digital diet. And so um, that's certainly a message that we make a point of with our community. Um, as well as in the way we build our applications, as I know all of our companies are very consciously aware of um, just adding to that noise of all of the media. It's a challenging, uh, a challenging space, isn't it? Being in a tech company with the need to fund that tech invention and development and to keep the investors happy and to, to do all that stuff. And then at the same time to have a, an, you know, a built in mission to do some kind of good in the world. That's a real difficult one. However you look at it, there's, there's conflicts there some, to some degree. I, I know Anna, just because of the fact I know what you, you're up to a bit more than everyone else, but in terms of your investor discussions and the people you talk to, do you, do you kind of bring this into those discussions or do you, do you end up filtering them and, you know, do they pitch to you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, fundraising is always a match make. And I think uh, it's extremely important if you are mission driven that your um, uh, investors buy into that, that mission. Um, personally, I think that um, great financial success is, is a way as a path and a route to having impact. So I don't think they need to contradict each other. And unfortunately, the mental um, um, health industry is abundant, unfortunately. And I hope we will all <laughs> in a number of years not be needed anymore. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think so. But at the same time, um, and I think that's another thing that has been um, accelerated with uh, with the recent events, and that is that investors actually, just like many other people, are asking themselves, how am I adding value? What is the purpose? And are looking, there's more money going into uh, mental health, both because the, it's, it's a... It's a a realization of the magnitude of the industry, uh, but also because genuinely uh, they're in the investor space field as well. In the investor space, there's a lot of more growing interest in um, in impact. Deborah, have you have you been taking investment for the last twenty years and seen any ebb and flow, change of attitude? You know, how's it looked in that period of time raising money? I I would agree it's changed dramatically. Uh, we made a decision early on because we're a mission driven company about helping to activate heart and humanity and we have our own integrity that we follow and I think that's important is that we weren't going to take any money and though we had many offers from venture capitalists who saw the potential of our technology research what, what we were doing. Um, we have angel investors who've been in it for the long haul because we started back in 1990s and uh, very mission focused. But the, it has changed because just uh, as we were just saying, it's the, the VCs, the investors, the hedge fund managers are stressed out themselves. And they themselves are looking for solutions and they want to invest in what's going to help them and their families as well, knowing the market is huge for stress and mental health. So the attitudes towards money are changing, the attitudes towards social responsibility and social impact as a metric of return on investment, all that's in process of change. Uh, we still prefer at this point in time to bootstrap or be self, we can, so be self-funding rather than go out for 
money where we would have any sort of uh, self-compromise of what we would we feel is needed. But that doesn't to say we wouldn't take investment if it was the right mission alignment and the right uh, ability to, to control our own destiny and make those choices. So I think that's a, something every company has to evaluate. And I know too many startups who have compromised their integrity. Yeah, it's a real tough one. The, yeah, the, the, the matchmaking idea, the kind of bringing together of the right teams Right. so important and like you say lots of lots of people fall by the wayside especially if they're desperate for money and they go out to investment uh you know with that kind of over them i'm gonna i'm gonna turn to you wendy on a question that you you just sort of talked to me about it before i thought it was really fascinating and, and it got me thinking you know many years ago let's say 100 years ago people maybe weren't that stressed compared with what they like now and in that time we've had pharmaceutical drugs and treatments and we've gone through an industry of chemical um treatment for for many things uh you, you sort of flagged that maybe technology can start to move us away from that world is tell me more about that yeah well we just get really excited about the concept of having non-drug alternatives to um, what would have traditionally been treated with um, pharmaceuticals. Um, helium is not a replacement for psychotropic medications or diagnostic, but what we do try to provide our users is an option to try these methodologies um, that are digital interventions um, that help build this mental resilience um, apart from those um, you know, traditional treatments. And so um, as we continue to build that out, we'd love to in the pharmacies people walk into in a, that there's a digiceuticals aisle that you could scan a QR code and download one of these applications or buy some of these wearables that give you insight into what is your body doing? How are you reacting? And how can you learn to control that um, in a way that doesn't necessarily have lots of side effects or other um, other concerns. And so the digiceuticals aisle is something we dream big about um, where you have a mental health hygiene cabinet um, alongside your actual pharmaceuticals as well. So, um, and I think that we're all working to achieve these options um, for people to provide just the bigger, broader spectrum on what we would uh, normally address mental health or other physical treatments. I guess um, to a great extent, everyone here is working on that, you know, stress reduction through non-medicated uh, non forms. That's that's kind of what you're all doing. So it's it's kind of the evidence is there, isn't it? It's clearly a, a way forward, at least in some aspects of people's lives. And Anna, you've you've got plenty of experience with uh, with a physical device and stress. And have you got anything to add to that kind of D pharma pharmaceutical <laughs> discussion? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, very interesting. I think, uh, you know, we, sh we don't need to villainize the entire pharma industry. But back to my point again uh, on the on the panel about KPIs that drive um, that drive industries. Uh, so, you know, it, it's challenging. It is something that it's a really big conversation that I'm very fascinated about, which is also kind of the future of our economy, of regulation. And I mean, there's so many things that have changed enormously um, since we set up our current regulatory systems and our institutions and so on. Um, and that includes acceleration of accumulation of money through through technology um, and, and just that the public market works very, very different today, etc. cetera. So um, for pharma, I think for a lot of people, uh, there is a conflict where by um, driving um, revenues for, for a company isn't always coherent with uh, driving health for the individual. And so that is, a, I think it's, that's why I'm welcoming conversation and debate um, about how we create a, a um, uh, a responsible industry and 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 combine those things and I think uh, you know leadership in that space is, is really really important but there is also a combination I mean there's obviously times where pharmaceuticals um, are needed but hopefully with our type of uh, products we can reduce that to a very very small percentage uh, there's such a lot of disease that is a consequence or that is accelerated by um, inflammation and lowered immune system as a, as a consequence of stress so I have no doubt that our industry can completely transform 
um, how we shift also towards preventative um, um, health. Yeah, it's interesting you, you link into preventative and that's kind of uh, you know part of what we're doing with lots of the projects we work on is around that whole theme actually you know my grand falling over and breaking her hip and ending up in hospital and going through a whole series of completely preventable trauma including pharmaceuticals across multiple dimensions you know there's so much that we can do with 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 technology it's uh it's just really frustrating that it takes so long to kind of you know change habits not just of people but people administering people so doctors and physicians who are, are in that space who are, who are maybe not don't have access to some quite basic technologies um so there's a long way to go um i think I'm, I'm pretty sure we should have wrapped up 15 minutes ago but i'm not really sure nobody's given me a cue so i, I expect there's, there's still an audience out there but we really should wind up now as we're getting on for six o'clock in the uk um i'm gonna say thank you again to everyone on the panel it's been absolutely fantastic to speak to you again and um, yeah really look forward to carrying on the discussions if you want to reach any of the panelists today uh, look at the giant website or go to thrivewearables.com slash giant 2020 um, and you'll be able to get their details or, or my details or, or the, the team here so thank you again to everyone and have a great evening or day depending on where you are